Capitola City Council. Um, and uh, we will, one, I want to um, welcome everyone here who is uh, in the chambers, um, and I also want to welcome everybody who is watching uh, from home. And so we'll begin with a roll call. Councilor Norton? Here. Councilor Bator? Here. Councilor Termini? Here. Mayor Story? Here. And I do want to let everybody know that uh, Council Member Harlan is not feeling well this evening, and so she will not be joining in us. Uh, so next we'll uh, have the Pledge of Allegiance uh, led by Council Member uh, Termini. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Yes. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, I'd just like to let you know that it's just pure accident that Michael Termini and I are wearing the same shirt tonight. We are not bookends. And we just have the same closet, <laughs> sort of. Well, you look like Bob Z twins. Yes, um, we read the memos. Where's your shirt? <laughs> and so next, let's move on to uh, presentations uh, this evening. Um, and the first one are, uh, we have certificates of commendation to Detective Sarah Ryan, Detective Leo Marino, and Sergeant Mark Gonzalez. Uh, and I'd like to... Um, Welcome, uh, Chief Escalante, to give the presentations. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council Members. It, it, this is my honor, one of the things that I love to do, and uh, we have a lot of good cases and a lot of opportunities to recognize folks for all the great work that they do. Uh, th this case here, and unfortunately, it was that of a, a homicide that occurred in November 9th of 2013. Uh, where a businessman lost his life in the city of Capitola. And for those who don't know, when these cases happen, they're very difficult to work through. Uh, it involves 24-hour uh, shifts. It involves interviewing victims, uh, witnesses. It involves um, working with family members. And in this particular case, there was a lot of information that was out there, and we had no suspect information from the very start. And so the detectives and Sergeant Gonzalez had to really work to develop information. Time is of the essence. You have to locate witnesses and try and preserve the scene as best you can. And in the city of Capitol, it is a smaller agency, and so we're not afforded all the resources that a larger agency might have. And so in this instance, the two detectives, Sarah Ryan and Leo Moreno, uh, with the assistance of Sergeant Gonzalez, uh, literally worked around the clock, not just one day, but a couple of days, but they did take some breaks, and worked with every agency in the county except for one. They also worked with state agencies that came from out of the area. And they also work in hand-in-hand in hand with our district attorney's office, and they are here as well uh, to assist in uh, recognizing them for their hard work. And in a short period of time, they were able to develop enough leads and evidence to actually arrest uh, two suspects involved in this case. And for those who don't know, cases like this actually go on for a long period of time after that. And it is a real big detailed case. And so for them to be able to put all that together and still maintain a caseload, and for Sergeant Gonzalez, who is not assigned in the investigation section, he actually got pulled back from patrol to help assist in this and then also had to manage his patrol shift, I think uh, is... Uh, just really remarkable at the work that they did. And so I wanted to recognize them today in front of the council <coughs> and their peers and thank them for a great job and for the safety that they help provide our community. Leo and Sarah and Sergeant Mark Gonzalez. Words of wisdom? Oh. <laughs> or, or just words. I just want to say thank you, Council. Thank you, Chief. Um, thanks to Celia Rowland. She's here. If you want to stand up, I'd like to share this with you, Celia. 
she was part of our team and she helped us out. In addition to that, where is Dan Flippo? Is he here? He snuck out because he probably knew I was going to do this. Uh, Lieutenant Flippo from the Santa Cruz P Police Department was here also. And he commanded the tactical team that actually caught the suspects for us. So we were very thankful for that. Thank you very much. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys. We really appreciate it. Yeah. Our next presentation is we like to honor uh, our retirees, and one of them just happened to be a canine. And uh, one of our local canines, Katie, who gave us a little over five years of service to the police department, apprehended numerous suspects, assisted numerous agencies, not only in Santa Cruz County, but outside Santa Cruz County, tracking suspects, uh, drug recognition, locating uh, suspected narcotics, assisting in locating missing people. Uh, Katie did a lot of work for the police department, and for those who attend National Light Out up at J Street Park, she provided numerous demo demonstrations for us and did tremendous work. And uh, Katie retired recently in December after five years of service, and her partner, where's Leo? <laughs> she did the work. Leo just drove. <laughs> or, I'm sorry, Pedro just drove. <laughs> yeah, I just drove around. That's right. But anyway, uh, the handler, you know, does so much work in the training that goes into this and the care and the feeding and the nurturing of the program. And it's a lot of work that goes into it. It takes a ton of commitment. And there's a lot of pride that goes into being a canine handler. And people don't really realize that. And so, Pedro, I really want to thank you for all the work that you've put into the canine program and for all the work that Katie has done over the years. I hope she enjoys retirement. Yes. <laughs> so I want to present this to you as a little token of our appreciation for her. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, Chief, uh, for those presentations. And, um, and I want to extend a thank you to the officers who were involved in that homicide. Uh, and, and, and quickly apprehending the suspects. And for all the officers who are here and not here, including Katie, uh, who uh, serve our community, keep us safe, uh, and of, you know, put yourself in harm's way for the benefit, for the health and safety of, um, of the residents of Capitola. So thank you very much, uh, and it's an, an honor for me to be your, serve as your mayor, and I think for these council members as well. Uh, to, um, you know, be able to serve you. Uh, so um, uh, thanks again. And now, and, and you, and Chief Escalani, thank you uh, for that presentation and, and bringing that recognition to us this evening. And so next, we'll move on to the next item on our agenda, which is a presentation by Michelle Williams uh, of the Arts Council of Santa Cruz County. She is the executive director. Good evening, Michelle. Good evening, Mayor. Good evening, Council members. You know, there's a saying in the arts to never perform with animals or children if you want any attention <laughs> at all. So I'm going to try to be half as entertaining and wonderful as the story of Katie. So um, delighted to be here for part of that. So yes, I'm Michelle Williams. I'm the director of Arts Council Santa Cruz County. Do I do this right here? Mm -hmm. uh, okay, great. And I'm going to speak to you very briefly about the impact of the Arts Council on our programs and then about the economic impact of the arts in Santa Cruz County. So a little bit briefly about the Arts Council. This is our mission. I'll give you a moment to read it. And in our mission, it, it contains the strategies we use to do all of our work, which is promote, connect, and invest. So in 1979, uh, Capitola was one of our jurisdictional partners that came together to create the Arts Council. And 35 years later, because of your 35 years of support, we are still going strong. Since 1979, uh, which is when we were created and when our grants program was launched, we have given over $5 million out that supports events that are seen and enjoyed by over 500,000 people every year. In 1980, we launched Spectra, our award-winning arts education program, and since then we've been inspired and engaged over half a million school children through music, dance, theater, visual, literary, media arts, you name it. And in 1986, we uh, started producing the Open Studios Art Tour, and since then, thousands of artists have maintained and built careers through it, and hundreds of thousands of people have been connected to friends, neighbors, and strangers through this community building program. 
And then in 2011, we acquired Mariposa's Art, which is an after-school arts program with a powerful youth development component. Uh, we serve over 2,000 youth each year through that, teaching them not just art forms, but also key leadership skills. And between Mariposa's Art and Spectra, we serve over 10,000 children every year. And we see this is the year as uh, defining our next 35 years. So there are a lot of sayings about this county. I've heard, keep it weird, take it back, keep it safe. And we say keep it artful. A couple of facts. We are the second smallest county in California by region, but we have the fourth largest arts council. And we have the fifth highest population of artists per capita in the country. The arts, including creativity and innovation, are part of what I believe make this county such a fantastic and special place to live. And it's because we've been intentional about fostering and supporting that creativity for many decades. When the Capitola City Council helped create the Arts Council 35 years ago, we were the big thing that was going to help the arts moving forward. And 35 years later, we're carrying on that tradition, and the Arts Council is now supporting some of the next big things in our community. For instance, we are providing leadership on a local, regional, national level. My colleagues and I have served on panels for the National Endowment for the Arts, for the California Arts Council. Our o Open Studios grants and arts education alliances are all being used currently as models throughout the country. Uh, you also have likely heard about the resurgence of what is now Santa Cruz Shakespeare, formerly Shakespeare Santa Cruz and Shakespeare Play On. Uh, we have been the fiscal sponsor for that effort and helped them raise $1.2 million in just under two months, and they have a season running in the Glen this summer. So we were instrumental in that and helped them play on this summer. That was very exciting. We also believe very strongly in building the capacity of artists and organizations throughout the county. We're about to launch a new grants program called the Elevate Program. And in that program, we're going to work with a small cohort of smaller organizations, arts organizations, and give a three-year commitment with the idea of creating the next Cabrillo Music Festival, the next Coomba Jazz Center. So that's a very exciting program. And we also provide hours of one-on-one -on -one support to artists and arts organizations. And finally, this is something that lights my fire the most. Um, this is actually a picture last year of a supervisor friend and a child from the student art exhibit. I don't know if you've been to the county government building in the last week, but we've just put up our uh, art show there, and it is spectacular. We got uh, 760 pieces of art to put up in that center, and I have a couple of uh, flyers here for you. That May I just pass these? And uh, that's going to be up for the next month. And it is, if you ever want to f experience what it's like to not be artful and be artful, go to the county government center when there's no art up, and then go up when this show goes, because it's just, it's extraordinary. But this idea of us working with partners you might not expect us to is something that we're really focusing on. We recently partnered with about 20 different, or, uh, different organizations to put on a forum about the <coughs> Affordable Health Care Act to help both artists and community members uh, get health insurance. We also recently submitted a grant in partnership with the San Lorenzo River Alliance to use the arts to activate and make more safe the San Lorenzo River. And we are a sponsor of the Open Streets program coming up here in Capitola next month. And the idea is here that we are helping to address broad community issues using the arts as an effective tool to create dialogue and community change. We all know that the arts do incredible things for our hearts and our minds and our souls and our community, but the arts actually do so much more. And I think this beautifully sums it up. You've just heard about how the Arts Council and the arts are changing lives. And I'm going to invite you for the next couple of minutes to think about the arts a little bit differently. So if I may, a couple weeks ago was my husband's birthday, and I took him out on a date night. And we decided we were going to go to an arts event, naturally. And so we looked at brochures. We looked at some websites. We bought theater tickets online. I bought a new dress, which is a banner moment for me. Uh, we got a babysitter, and we parked at a downtown garage. We ate dinner out. We went to a show, had dessert after the show, and had this incredible night. But in that one night, think about all the industries that we touched. Web designers for the websites graphic designers for the brochures, e-commerce for the tickets, retail for my dress, uh, babysitters, which is truly the racket in all of this, uh, revenue for the city for parking at the restaurant, think about the waiters, the restaurant owners, the farmers who sell to that restaurant, and then at the theater, plumbers, electricians, actors, set designers, directors. We all love the arts, and we think of them as a wonderful amenity, but they are businesses, and they are spending money in creating a product that drive our economy. So to put this into real numbers, we conducted in uh, partnership with Americans for the Arts, an arts and economic prosperity study, and this is what we found out. 
This study was done uh, in all 50 states, including Santa Cruz County. We surveyed arts and culture organizations throughout the county, over 70 of them, and we also uh, surveyed the audiences. And what we found out is, annually, artists and or arts organizations and their audience spend $38.4 million every year. In, now, this, in this county? In this county. And I'll point out, this is just the arts nonprofit sector. It does not include individual artists. It does not include movies or architects or any of the creative industries, just the arts nonprofit sector. This number is broken up into two figures, $21.8 million by the organizations themselves spending every year. And that leverages an additional $16.5 million by arts, aud arts audiences. Now, we worked with a team of economists from Georgia Tech, and this was modeled specifically for Santa Cruz County, and I'll speak a little bit more about it in, in a minute, but you can feel very confident in these numbers. The arts also support jobs, actively support jobs, at the organizations themselves, the people that they hire. So $38.5 million, 877 jobs right here in this county. We always say the arts provide food for the soul, but they're also providing food for the table for 877 households in this community and also generating government revenue. And this number breaks out into two, uh, $1.4 million for local revenue and $3.8 million for state revenue. Now, every time a dollar changes hands at the grocery store or gas station, there's an economic impact, but very few industries generate the kind of event-related spending that the arts do. Again, thinking about my date night with my husband. And then think about the last time you took your significant other to uh, a similar event and all the industries that you touched. So this is what a typical attendee spent per person beyond the cost of admission. And it breaks out some of the areas where they did the spending. But we also asked all these folks for their zip code as well. Now, this data is based on 567,000 attendees at 72 organizations. And what we found is that a full quarter of our arts audiences are non-local, 26%, uh, with 74% being local. So for a typical non-local, they spent uh, $64.48 per person, and the locals spent about $16.56 per, uh, per person. So you can see why cultural tourism is such a major driver. A couple uh, very important things. 74% of non-local attendees, their primary reason for their trip was the arts event. So they came here for the arts event, they went out to dinner, they spent their money, and then they went home. <laughs> we like that. So you can start to see the pull of the arts. Uh, another very key thing, over 40% of our resident arts attendees said that if the event had happened somewhere else in a different community, they would have traveled out of the community to go to it. So it, this says that when we invest in the arts, we invest in a product, and it's a product that draws people into our community and keeps our neighbors here as well. It just says a vibrant art community is great for local business. Um, and one last figure that I'll point out, which is that Arts audiences are not just spending money, they are giving their time to a valuation of $2.1 million uh, each year. This is not factored into the study, it's just an important um, statistic to know that these are people building community for us. So uh, I believe you were provided with copies of the report, and if you look on the back side of the report, you'll see that a lot of your national partners were partners on this study. Uh, the Conference of Mayors, League of Cities, of Counties, the U.S. Chamber of Conference, and the Conference Board, these organizations are partners because they believe that the arts are a cornerstone of our economy, and they have bought into the results, and so I hope you will feel confident into doing so as well. The story to me is when we invest in the arts, we aren't investing in a, f in a frill, we're not just invent uh, investing in our youth, and nor are we in investing at the expense of economic development. Rather, we are creating, uh, we are creating jobs and we're creating an ec a major economic driver. And in the end, it just means that the arts mean business. Any questions? Michelle, would you give a little uh, plug right now for Open Studios? <laughs> Sure. For Open Studios? Yes. Absolutely. Well, we are accepting applications right now. I believe the deadline is, gosh, is it the end of this month? I've got a lot of deadlines in my head right now, but I believe it's the end of this month, and we would love to have even more Capitola artists participate. We always have several, but we'd love to boost that up. So, yes, that's coming along, and it's going to be another incredible year. Thank you. Sure. You know the questions? Well, thank you, Michelle, for that very compelling and artful presentation. Mm -hmm. Uh, Absolutely. And thank you for the work that you do and all your staff are for um, you know, bringing art to our community. Sure. Let me leave you with one last thought, if yes. I may. 
the city of Capitola, the funding that you give the Arts Council, we funnel that into our grants program. We give about $185,000 in grants every year, and we believe that is the seed money for this $38.4 million. And in the end, what that means is that when you invest in the Arts Council, you're investing in your community. And we're really grateful, and I'm grateful for the time tonight. Great. Thank you. So next we'll move on to a report on closed session. Thank you, uh, Mayor Story. We had a very uh, short closed session this evening. Uh, it was scheduled for 15 minutes, and we didn't even need the entire 15 minutes. We had one um, one uh, liability claim to discuss, and that was the liability claim of Patricia Greenwood. We had a brief discussion among council members concerning that claim, but the council took no uh, reportable action in closed session. And that's the end of my oral report. Right. Thank you, John. Uh, the next item is additional materials. Um, I believe we did have uh, uh, some additional materials presented to us here at the dais, and uh, one was a preliminary cost estimate for McGregor Park. Uh, that is on the agenda for discussion later. Um, and I believe there were some additional materials um, concerning this actual the presentation by Ms. Williams. Next, we have additions and deletions to the agenda. Are there any re requested additions or uh, deletions to the agenda? Seeing none, we'll move on uh, to public comments. This is an opportunity for members of the public to address the council on items not on tonight's agenda. And good evening. Hi. Good evening. I'm Deborah Bone. I'm the director of the Cabrillo College Stroke and Disability Learning Center. And I'm here because I want to thank you for your longtime support of our program. I'm also a member of the Human Care Alliance. I think most of you probably know that. And I just wanted to bring you a little bit of an update about our program and invite you to our Honors Day celebration coming on May 22nd. Um, as most of you know, our program is an educational rehabilitation program. We serve adults who have become disabled, primarily after a stroke or some other medical condition like a Parkinson's diagnosis, multiple sclerosis, a brain injury, a brain tumor. We are part of the Disabled Students Programs and Services at Cabrillo College, and we serve about 150 students each semester. All of the participants enroll in the college as students, and they participate in small classes, small group activities, primarily in mobility and fitness, communication and speech because often stroke leaves people without the use of language and then counseling and support to really adapt and learn how to become disabled after probably not thinking about it very much prior to the event that probably leads into needing our services. Um, we are planning a four-week summer session. We're uh, closing for the end of the semester, and then we'll be open mostly in June, and then we come back at the end of August for the fall. We sort of follow the academic calendar. Um, we're very excited because we continue to add new activities. We have a variety of um, supportive activities, including our choir. We have a ceramics program. We have expressive arts. We have some creative movement. We really want a comprehensive program to help adults who've become disabled to learn skills, be maintain their independence, and enjoy a community of support. And really, it's that community of support that we count on to help people really find a new way of being after such an event. And you have all participated, I think, actually longer than I have at the Stroke Center. And part of why I came to talk to you is to say goodbye in this role because I'm planning to retire at the end of this year. And I wanted to come personally to thank you for the support and for the relationships that I've had with some of you over the eight years that I've been in this role with the Stroke Center eight years before that as a nursing instructor, 20 years before that as a nurse in the community, and um, looking forward to changing a little bit my pace of life. I have a wonderful person coming after me, Cynthia Fitzgerald. She comes to us with a background in psychology, gerontology. She's worked in education. I know that you will get to meet her, and I hope you will welcome her on board. She will be a great addition to our program. And um, as, we, as I pass the torch off to her, we're also entering our 40th year. Uh, the program was started in 1974, so at some point during the next year, we'll be celebrating those 40 years. The program began as a small support group in Green Acres Elementary School, moved in 76 up to De La Vega Park. Some of you may have seen our center up there, and then in 2010 to the Aptos campus at Cabrillo. So again, our Honors Day is May 22nd. I've got my card in case any of you would like information further.
hope some of you will make it up there. We'll be in the Horticulture Center from 10 to 12 on that Thursday morning. We honor the two-year and four-year, um, you could say, graduates, people who have completed two and four years in the program and all of their accomplishments, and we celebrate the program. We'd love to have you join us, and we look forward to partnering with you for another 40 years. So thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Thanks for coming this evening and, uh, and reporting to us on this Cabrillo Stroke Center, and congratulations on your retirement. And yes. I'm sure I'll see you all again. Yes. I'll be down here for some of that art and wine stuff. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. Good to see you. Good night. Good evening. I'm Margaret Kinsler. I'm here tonight as a representative of the Capitola Village Residents Association. And while I'm here, I might as well update you on a few things that have been going on in our association. We recently had a, uh, elections for um, officers, um, so now our president is Janet Russell, our vice president is Nels Westman, our um, secretary is Judith Feynman, and our newsletter editor and webmaster is Rich Diday. Um, and Rich is also writing or responsible for getting anyway an article into the Capitol of SoCal Times every month. So look for uh, the CVRA article in the Capitola SoCal Times at the beginning of each month. Um, it has something to do with Capitola. And finally, Lin Linda Hansen is our membership coordinator. And CVRA uh, recently um, participated in getting out the word about the Esplanade Day, the open streets in Capitola Day. We were asked to send um, an email to all of our membership and uh, give them a heads up about that upcoming event. And we plan on being there with the table and signing up some new members. So see you there. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Margaret. Is there anyone else that would like to address the council on items not on tonight's agenda? Seeing none, I'm going to close the microphone. Um, for this por portion of the agenda, and we'll move on to uh, City Council, City Treasurer, and staff comments. Uh, let's start with staff comments. Council members, <clears throat> I have a brief announcement that this week the Coastal Commission approved our LCP amendment to add the Lower Pacific Cove to the parking meter zone. Uh, so that's good news. So as soon as the parking lot is complete and open, uh, we're all set to <coughs> integrate it into our parking meter program. Thank you, Jamie. That's good news. Uh, any other staff comments? Uh, and noting that the treasurer is not here, I'll bring it back to the council. Council comments. Yes, Dennis. I'd like to just announce, um, and Margaret started me off this, on May 4th, um, we'll be holding our first open streets program in, in cooperation with the city and Ecology Action, um, where Esplanade will be closed down from 11 to 4 for community use. And so it's a day that everyone in our community anyone's visiting us can come down and enjoy that what what it's really like to go to the village and not have to negotiate cars and so that's going to go from 11 to 4 on the 4th of, of May there'll be a series of uh, small events down there there'll be music down there there'll be a, a raffle um, and uh, it'll just be a fun day also the Chamber of Commerce is also holding a kite fly flying contest that day anybody wants to enter that and um, and come down and join us on May 4th it'll be a fun day thank you thank you yes Mike I want to thank everyone in Capitola who came down and made the Wounded Warriors Operation Surf Program just a phenomenal success at our beach this last weekend. Uh, the whole town turned out. They had an amazing time, and it was their first time they had come to Capitola and had their surfing event. It was moving on all sides and all in all aspects, so thank you all. Yeah, thank you. Ed? Okay. Ed? Okay. Um, I wanted to let uh, everyone know and, uh, and also the council that uh, I'd been invited to attend the Santa Cruz World Surfing Reserve Summit, uh, which is going to be held on Friday, April 25th, uh, and there are a group of, of surfing organizations that are coming in to discuss uh, about ways that we can uh, protect and preserve uh, our surfing habitat uh, here um, in Santa Cruz. And so I don't know if the council has any particular thoughts uh, about that. I'd be welcome to yeah, hear them before I... Uh, it's really good because it's a worldwide organization now. Yeah. <clears throat> Unfortunately, Capitola was not included in it because they included all of Pleasure Point down to, to Sharks Cove, and then they cut it off right there. They really, if they were including Pleasure okay. Point as a surf break, they should have included Capitola. So maybe our mayor could move towards 
including capital well, I, and that okay. service. Okay. Well, thanks for letting me know, Dennis. I will certainly bring that up. Um, and um, and since they invited me there, I think they should <laughs> certainly include us uh, in uh, uh, as part of the surfing reserve. Um, so, um, any other comments? Uh, seeing none, I'm going to move us on then to the agenda. On the agenda, um, uh, the next item is board commissions and committee appointments. Uh, I don't believe we have any this evening, uh, so we will go on to the consent calendar. These items will be voted on when one motion, unless an item is pulled. Does any member of the public wish to pull uh, one of the consent agenda items? Seeing none, council members? I'll move the consent agenda. I'd like to pull item um, number C just for a quick question. I'll, I'll second that motion. Okay, there's a motion to approve the consent and seconded, uh, but uh, maybe before we uh, take that vote, we could uh, uh, get Dennis's question answered. Okay, is Lisa here? Hi, Hi Lisa. Hi. Um, this 15000 for paying the junior guards to go through the course? That's correct. What, what's the hourly wage for that? So they get paid about $13 an hour. We're talking about up to 24 instructors for 40 hours, and I round it up. Okay. Is this going to be an ongoing cost for the city to do this? No, it'll decrease over time because you have to go through the 40 hours of training initially, and after that you only have to go through 16 hours. So if we can get all 24 uh, right at the beginning, and then over time, maybe it'll be five or six as, you know, f through attrition. You guys come in, you go out. So, no, it'll significantly decrease. Thank you, Lisa. You answered my question. $13 an hour is very fair. For okay. Thank you. I'll call the question on the motion. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. The motion passes unanimously. Which will bring us to um, the general government public hearing portion of our agenda t this evening and the first item is to consider the approval of plan specifications in the engineer's estimate for the construction of the McGregor Park, authorized to advertise for bids and a budget amendment allocating $130,000 within the capital improvement program from undetermined park improvements to the McGregor Park project. Uh, that's a mouthful, but we're talking about developing the pump track, the skateboard park, uh, and the dog park at, on the McGregor property. Um, what we're being asked to do is to approve the plans and specif specifications and the engineering estimate tonight to approve the budget allocation of $130,000 and approve modifications to the McGregor Park donation and sponsorship program. So, Steve, you're going to lead us in the staff report? Yeah. Thank Good you. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Tonight, um, we're taking hopefully the uh, final step uh, to begin the McGregor Park project. This project, uh, the plans have been completed based on the conceptual approval by the City Council. Uh, just to refresh everybody's memory, the park includes uh, an area for the development of a 12,500 square foot dock park, a 9,500 foot pump track, a 10,300 square foot skate park. And I'd just like to say at this point that those, we are developing the areas for those parks. Um, the actual elements and improvement of those are part of the fundraising and sponsorship program. Um, the, the project will include a 30 space parking lot, a seating area and a kids play area. <coughs> and there's a uh, landscaping and irrigation also included. Um, here's the a site plan uh, from the construction drawings. Uh, really quickly, we have McGregor Drive across the top here. Highway 1 would be above that. Uh, we have the parking lot to the east of the property here. Uh, we have an area here that's designated for the skate park. This is the area designated for the dog park. And to the west, we have the uh, area designated for the pump track. It does include a small seating area and, and garbage uh, cans will be put here and a drinking fountain in the middle and a, a small kids play area uh, also. Um, like I said, the, the improvements within each area is part of the uh, fundraising program. Uh, right now, the plans do include paving approximately half of the skate park to give a small skate area. We're actually uh, a modification to this plan is we were actually flip-flopping 
paving the eastern end in, end now and leaving the western end unpaved. <coughs> it's just a flip-flop uh, within the skate park with these plans. Um, so tonight we want to talk to you about the fundraising and sponsorship efforts. And with that, I'll ask Lisa to step up if she can and give us an update on that. All right, so I'll start with some of our successes. And so for the dog park, um, we have identified um, a sponsor. And we have also, if you recall, that the in the sponsorship program, we had identified that there was a level of 10,000 was our platinum level, and that was our naming rights. And we thought that that 10,000 was going to be the cost to install that element. Well, now we think it's going to be closer to seven or eight thousand dollars. And so one of the things I'm going to want to do this evening is to tell you where our, where we are in our fundraising, and also to maybe amend our uh, donation sponsorship program to reflect what we think are some of the new costs. So, like I said, with the dog park, we think it's closer to probably around 8000 to install that element. Uh, we have had a, a donor step forward and is very interested in, in proceeding and, and providing funding for that. And I'm hoping to uh, request that the, stat the council will reduce the, the naming rights from the 10000 to the 8000 and then subsequently reduce each of those levels by the same percentage. Uh, with the bike park, it's been very successful. I've had a lot of interest in funding. Uh, I had a proposal to install in the particular area for $15,000 uh, that we've for the identified area today in that particular plan. And so one of the requests I'd like is to see if we could adjust the, again, the sponsorship level. Uh, we had originally thought for that particular area it would be 25000 but like I said, it's, it's now coming in at about 15000 So I want to request that we adjust it um, proportionate to that amount. Um, so that's very exciting and actually I think I have more than enough money coming in for the bike park. There's a lot of people out there who want to donate and get this, um, the bike park rolling. They think it's a terrific location. The, the spot is very ideal to these folks. Uh, with the skate park, unfortunately I have had nobody step forward and with interest to um, provide funding. Uh, we've reached out to quite a few people in the community and still there is no interest. So that's something we might want to consider discussing tonight is that particular location um, and what we'd like to do if we don't have funding and what some of the alternatives are, uh, whether we want to expand the bike park into the, that area with the thought that maybe if somebody were to step forward we could scale back the bike park and still have it reserved or just leave it uh, a blank slate. And as usage continues to grow, maybe somebody will step forward and say, hey, this is a great idea. Let's, let's put some money towards this uh, to get that skate park in. So I'm not in particularly asking anybody, to, uh, the council, to uh, adjust the skate park funding donation sponsorship because, like I said, I haven't even identified anybody. But that's where we are today. So I think we'll be just fine working with the bike park and the dog park. But again, because of some of these issues that we're facing, whether it's uh, water or um, folks stepping up to, to donate, we might want to rethink some of the, the layout of the park this evening. I think we're going to talk a little bit about that. So if you have any questions with regards to that, I'm happy to answer. Yeah, Dennis, go ahead. Lisa, how much would we save if we did not pave any of the uh, skateboard area? I think the identified cost was 20, 25,000? About 23,000. I was just doing yeah, that it's calculation. It's actually a little yeah. higher than we were doing. It's yeah, about okay. almost $26,000 with the fencing and the paving. Uh, how, how difficult would it be if you allowed the bike park to span into that area to actually move the bike park back? Is that a, seems to me that's a territorial thing that may be difficult to maneuver after you set the parameters there. Well, I don't know from, a, from the standpoint of is it physically possible? Absolutely, because it's just moving yep. dirt, right? That's not a hard part to, to do. Um, from a territorial standpoint, that I haven't <laughs> considered that. I think that, that may be an issue. And aren't, isn't there facilities between those two right now in that map? Aren't there facilities? Oh, there's a, the seating node and the um, a, a play area where we're going to put some uh, natural elements, you know, the tree stumps and some yeah. other items in there. Uh, but we could shift all of that towards the right, towards the um, the unpaved skate area and we could shift the bike park simply because at this point I have quite a bit of funding out, out there available to the bike park beyond the 15000 that people are willing to donate. Mm -hmm. it, it's pretty amazing and we could go bigger. You know, I'm surprised that the, the skating community um, has not come forth. Have they given you reasons? Have they said it's 
we don't like the location, it's too small, we don't. The size uh, isn't the matter, the, the, the issue from my understanding is the location. They aren't happy with the, the spot, yeah. Well, we did have an offer from someone to put up facilities there, the wooden skateboard ramps. So we had interest in that. There was interest in the wooden. Um, I don't know that, th I think they were looking to be paid or they might fundraise for that. My only concern with the, the wooden ramps after now that, not that I'm a skate mm -hmm. park expert, but I've done quite a bit of research and because there's so much interest in this from the skating community, the, the manufacturers, they've been contacting me on a regular basis and providing me with their information. There is a significant difference and in cost between the wooden ramps and the, the metal fabricated ramps. The, the wooden ramps, of course, the lifespan could be three, maybe five years with the significant repairs that need to be done to them. With the, the metal ramps, they w are willing, most of the companies are willing to do a 20-year warranty. So anything that should happen to those ramps, they will come out, whether it's from the environment or, you know, manufacturer defect, they will come and, and repair them. So their lifespan is significantly longer. What, what is the cost then? What would be the cost if we had a funder to put in the metal system like you're talking about? Well, of course, I saw I have received a proposal from 50000 to 150000 okay. So it all depends on how much what you want to put in there. The 50000 proposal that I received was several uh, skate elements that, uh, without having gone out to the community to say, hey, do you like this? I mean, I showed it to my kids. They liked it. Uh, but I don't know what the rest of the community might think. But there's quite a few um, elements that would be in there. And one of the Part of the process that we would go through if we were to move forward and we were to get a fund or, or if the city were to fund that would be to get community input on what they thought of a design and, and the types of ramps that might be put in there. That's, I think that's significantly important. Thank you. Yeah, Mike. Have we reached out to the, the organization that was raising money for the McGregor Skate Park? I know they were selling t-shirts and having fundraisers and the boardroom was... The board, well, and so the boardroom was spearheading and that's who I did reach out initially to. Uh, who is very interested in doing wooden ramps, and and I think there's there's a decision that needs to be made at some point whether uh, they want to do wood, which again the lifespan is very very short, three to five years, or if you want to do something that has a longer lifespan that's from a contractor that's licensed, bonded, workers comp, and all those different things, and all the liability issues. Because now you're talking to my risk management hat's coming on, and that very much concerns me as a liability issue. Well, let me ask my favorite risk management person, John, <laughs> if, if we have someone who donates a bunch of wooden ramps and we put them in there, are we still covered under the liability umbrella of having a city skate park where, you know what I'm saying, we have a basically a skateboard store that wants to provide wooden ramps for that area? Yeah, it's our facility. <coughs> if we got sued, it would be under our, um, it would be a liability claim like any other liability claim. and we'd have to um, tender it to our, the, our liability um, JPA. Um, I guess Lisa would talk to the JPA before we added this to mm -hmm. our um, our list of facilities just to make sure they're okay with it. Would it be the, any different than the protection that places like Scotts Valley has in Santa Cruz for their skate parks? No, the liability uh, issues are the same and the immunities that are available to the city for injuries suffered. There are rules, specific rules on liability for skateboard parks. If we post the parks with uh, signs requiring helmets and things of that nature, uh, we get liability immunity for injuries that occur in those places. It seems to me since that we've always considered this a potential temporary place for a skateboard park, that reaching out to the boardroom again and saying, you know, if you want to provide and be the, even have naming rights to the park, and have wooden ramps in there that we should just latch onto that and go forward like we always another have. Another inducement, uh, if, if they're concerned about their liability, um, another inducement is for the city to indemnify them and hold them harmless against any claims. Um, I don't think we were looking for a skate park that was going to last 20 years. I, I think that this goes right along with the way we envision this and at some point we may find another place for a skate park. I could see where the pump track could get bigger someday if we found another place for the skate park, but I'm not worried about a five-year lifespan on wooden ramps. My, my concern, Councilmember Termini, with that is, is you know, having volunteers, effectively having volunteers um, build things like this. We don't have a building code sort of inspector process to verify that they're built to any sort of standard, I guess. 
it certainly gives me a lot more comfort level if we're going to a professional company that provides manufactured and tested ramps versus basically having volunteers uh, build wooden ramps um, over time. So there, it, it is, certainly we can explore it, but it is a little bit concerning given the limited lifespan, given the wear and tear, given the difficult coastal environment that these things are going to be placed in. Would, would that change um, our um, um, in protections under the, under the law if we went with wooden ramps built by volunteers? I don't think so. I think, um, you know, if we approve the design, we also get design immunity and things of that nature. There's a facility um, in Santa Cruz um, at Depot Park mm -hmm. with the wooden ramps right. for the um, bicycles. Uh, Swenson uh, Company, I think, put that in for the uh -huh. city. Okay. I have observed, with my close association with an NHS company, the most amazing ramps built by what you call non-professionals, but they're skateboarders. And I, there are better ramps down the street from me <laughs> at my neighbor's house that were built by non-professionals that look better than some of the ramps I've seen in skateboard parks. I have no qualms about letting those folks lose. This is definitely a build it and they will come sort of an affair. And I think if we get the wooden ramps in, we may see interest in some replacement after we get some activity down there. Uh, can just a question on the design um, what's planned for the other side of the skateboard area would there just be dirt or? yeah right now that is, is blank dirt we um, I, our intent here was to provide uh, the beginning of a of a skate park um, have somewhere where you could at least have some flat land to skate on until we got enough uh, interest in, in doing the rest of it um, mm -hmm. became a financial thing at the, to be honest sure. with you. But but to be clear, I think we're talking about flipping the asphalt so that that, that we would yeah. at least keep the blank area sort of near the other uses. And I think, you know, potentially we could look at maybe putting, because the child's play area is pretty informal. It's just tree stumps. Maybe putting that inside there, uh, which would give a little bit more room. It just seems like we have a pretty constrained site, and having a large sort of unused area seems like uh, you know, we can, yeah. this is intended to be temporary, and, and right. they could evolve over time. Why do we need to define this area right now? Why not, why not leave the book open right now, discuss the idea of having ramps, <coughs> conclude our, our discussion on the rest of the park, and just leave the budget as it is, as far as the skateboard park area, keep it out on the books, go and look for it, whether we can make it viable with a, with a, um, with a, uh, a wooden ramp system, and, and give it a little time to mature here. We don't know for sure we can do that, but if we can, uh, it sounds like the council may be interested in doing it that way, but, but we don't need to make a decision on all three of these spots now. We can make a final decision on both the bicycle part and the, and the dog park and move this project forward. I think all we're don't being pave anything. Just leave, leave it well, we all know what we want to do. What we're being asked for is to approve this budget, and I think that yeah. that's what we should be prepared to do. Mm -hmm. We can always get more granular on the skateboard park part of it, but I think this budget's fine, and it's what we always wanted to do. Sorry. I, I just have a question. <laughs> Lisa, um, you used the word proportion, and uh, you lost me. The, the, the dog park was at 10, and you said we're going to drop it to 8. So I calculated that as a 20% drop. And then you went from 25 on the bike. Did, does that drop it 20% to 20, or are you taking it to 15? I was going to take it to 15 because that is the proposal I received for the, loca for the oh. size that we identified. Okay. That 15 would be... Plenty. It was the word proportional that threw me off. What we're going to oh, do is just adjust it to the expected cost. You got it. Okay, so bike goes from 25 to 15, dog goes from 10 to 8, mm -hmm. and the skate park is zero. I'm just going to leave the skate park at, at what it is. That's but correct. there's no, but no, no contribution for that. I don't have any okay, contribution. Okay, great. That, that was my question. So can you explain, um, maybe Steve can, where the fences go? In other words, is the kid area, kid area protected from running out onto the road also? So... Yeah, I could be happy. There is a uh, split rail fence, follow the cursor here, that's going to go along the entire uh, edge of the, this portion of the, of the park part of the property. And then the kid area will have a separate split rail fence around it. The skate park has a four foot uh, vinyl clad chain link fence that will go around it. And the dog park has a wire uh, mesh fence that will surround it. How so high is that fence, do you? I think it's 42 inches high. Um, so 
So the bike park itself, um, the pump track area does not have a skate uh, fence outlying it. It's a little more free form. So the skate park, um, obviously we're not concerned about someone going in or after hours if we're having a four foot fence. Is that what is our intent with nighttime use or? Well, we will have a gate across the, the parking lot. So the okay. parking lot will be closed uh, on a nightly basis. Um, but yeah, we are not trying to uh, okay. keep people out or, and we're trying to keep people out, but we're not going to build a okay. uh, Bob Byer fence to do that. Um, the four foot fence is what we see at a lot of the other skate parks to uh, you know, just define where it is and keep the skaters separated from the other park users. Is there a big dog, small dog section to the dog park? There is not in this. Uh, I know a lot of parks have that. So is that? Yeah, um, maybe Lisa can address that. When I did the when I did the users group and we talked about the separating, uh, they actually felt like there just simply wasn't enough room okay. to, to separate us. Okay. What is the surface in the dog park? Natural. Dog they do not want bark put down there because they feel like it's it's it, it, it's detrimental to the the dog's paws. It doesn't feel good. It injures them. So they don't want anything in there. Will this require a lot of more water use and keeping the dust down and that type of thing, or is that well, hopefully even matter? Natural grasses <laughs> is what we're going to have. Okay. Yes. Okay. Dog friendly dirt. Dog friendly dirt. <laughs> well, dog friendly weeds. Yeah. Weeds better. But natural. <laughs> natural. Lisa, can I, I can I get clarification? Since you sat down, uh, <laughs> I <should just> stay. <laughs> has the boardroom confirmed that they're willing, or any, has anyone confirmed that they're willing to put up wooden ramps on the skate park portion? Well, you know, I, I wouldn't say confirmed, but I have talked to Terry. I haven't talked to him, the boardroom. I haven't talked to him lately, but we have gone in there a couple of times to talk about it, and he, he would love to be able to build them. Um, I, we didn't talk about who would pay for them, though so that that was a key piece that he, not necessarily that he's going to so pay for them, but he would definitely he could build so them. So currently, we have no commitments from anyone to fund the wooden skate ramps. That's correct. Okay, thank you. And Steve, correct me if I'm wrong, but we could approve this budget tonight, and you could go out to bid with the all of the skate park um, improvements as an adult on the bid? Yeah, I could modify it that way. Absolutely. Uh, what I'm saying is yeah. they, they can yeah. bid a base bid and then have it added if we have a skate park. Okay. I, th I think if that's going to be the strategy, which I, don't, I think is probably a good way to go at this point, um, my, my suggestion would be that we have some flexibility maybe to to kind of push or pull the design a little bit just, just so that we don't end up with sort of unused space. Um, you know, we finish the park and there's you know, fence around an unused space. There's a little bit of room to kind of push and pull because all the improvements are so, you know, low tech, if you will, mm -hmm. that uh, as we sort of figure out we're going to scale the skate park and kind of push and pull things a little bit around it. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, I think it makes uh, sense. And, and my, sen my sense is that this is going to have to come back to the council. Um, uh, even if we approve the whole budget, the whole engineering concept, um, having uh, change orders on the skate park portion, but if there is no commitment for even the wooden ramps, I think it it should come back at a future date uh, so that we can maybe consider alternative uses for that portion of the park. If we if we could build a park for fifty thousand, okay, that sounds, seems to be the low threshold, Lisa. That we're looking for one somebody coming to build a permanent park. Would this city be willing to put up half of that to make a make a park happen that is actually a, a more permanent facility in that spot? Maybe. Well, <laughs> but when you say park, you mean the skate park portion? The skate park park. If um, Lisa said the budget that their estimates were between 150,000 and 150,000, if we can get a program that we could build for 50,000. Would the city be willing to come up with half of the cost of that if we got someone else from the outside to do the other half? Well, I mean, I, I think I can only speak for myself, but I would certainly be interested. I mean, we would have to at, be at a point where we can 
review next year's budget, see how ending, we're ending up in this year's budget. Are there any available funds? You know, what is our financial situation? What is the strength uh, level of commitment by um, uh, a private party? But I, I, yeah, I think we should be, um, I, I would certainly be open to that concept. Uh, I, yeah. I would too, but it, at that point I would be in the commercial ramp arena. Okay. Yeah. You know, I'm not interested yeah. in spending twenty-five thousand to have somebody knock some wood together. Yeah, that sort of thing. Yeah. So, but right now we can we can budget and move forward with us without a decision on the skateboard park. Let it let it mature. Maybe there's something out there that we can deal with. Steve, you can adjust the bus budget. Yeah. Up. No, I think that'd work well to list as an alternate bid item. Okay. Um, and all the there's three elements of the skate park in the in the estimate. One is the paving. Uh, the bioswale, which uh, treats the water coming off of there, and then the fencing. So we'd make those three items um, alternate funding and uh, remove them. Uh, that way we can add them or delete them from the contract once we, once we get there. I'm, I'm a little bit hesitant about moving the parameters of the facilities, being that we were already predetermined that we needed that much space for a skateboard park, and all of a sudden we'd make it, will that make it more difficult for us to do that facility? So minor adjustments may be fine. Maybe they need more bike pump track area, but not to lose uh, any major part of that skateboard mm -hmm. par park to do it. Yeah. The, the intent was when this thing walked, walked in the door was a skateboard park, and we filled in everything around that. Yep. So, okay. Can I, uh, one additional question about the design, and then then I want to open it up. I have a few more elements. Oh, to you talk do. About oh, today. okay. Good. We have Thank other you. wrinkles. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> Unfortunately. Um, we do have some water issues there. Uh, there is a water service out there. Um, when we had a construction project utilizing site, they uh, worked with Soquel Creek to install a water service there. They used it for their slurry making project, I think, um, as uh, one of the sewer projects. Um, so we've recently been uh, contacted by Soquel Creek that even though there is water on site, it's, we don't have an approved use. Uh, for this park uh, to use the water and so we have submitted an application for them um, You know staff supports the idea, but as you all are well, uh, Soquel Creek is uh, Considering some strong uh, measures regarding future development and, and within their district and we do have uh, you know water credits that we negotiated as part of a sale of a portion of this property at Soquel Creek um, I think we can get it all worked out, but this is uh, kind of uh, came up in the last couple of days, and uh, we are working with them to uh, get this as an approved use on the site. The water use there is going to be minimal. All the landscaping that's on these plans is uh, all drought tolerant. We will have an irrigation system put in just to keep it alive for the first year, and then essentially it gets turned off. The skate, par the pump track has some. You know, you need to keep that dust free. So that has some elements or a couple of drinking fountains. Uh, the, the restroom facilities are going to be portable toilets, so those will be pumped out manually. So kind of have this hanging out there. Our recommendation at this point is that we move forward with getting the bids and uh, you know, we'll, we'll continue to work with SoCal Creek Water. If uh, something uh, unexpected occurs, we would certainly return to council for further direction. Um, so we do have a, a, a detailed estimate, which I've given you, is $135,000. And so just to close out, our recommendations are to approve the plans. Uh, it sounds like we've come up with some changes to how we're going to bid the items, but if you have any other changes, now would be a good time to bring them up. Uh, the specifications, the estimate authorized me to advertise for bids. Uh, approve a budget amendment reallocating uh, $130,000 within the capital improvement budget. So just as a recap for the funding, um, $15,000 was allocated to this project um, as part of the mid-year. And the, some of that, 10 of that has gone toward the design work that has taken place already, leaving $5,000 here with the $130,000, which was earmarked for uh, undetermined park projects um, in the last budget process. Um, we will have the $135,000 available in funding uh, for the bids. And we're also asking for you to approve the modifications to the donation and sponsorship program uh, outlined by Lisa. Thank you. Thank you, Steve.
Um, yeah, go Just ahead. Just a now. question for Steve. Um, when you mentioned the bike track, the methods for keeping on the desk, what, what exactly is that? Um, I, actually, I asked Jamie. Or yeah. I, think it, I think it involves probably on a, a weekly basis watering the, tar, the track down. Is that an automatic system or is that someone with a hose? I think it's someone with a hose. Okay. It can be done even less than once a week, and, once a and month. I was under the impression that when we sold that property, we had secured water rights for that property. We, we owned the water rights to the property. It was right. water credits. Yeah, we credit. secured water credits for that property, um, one acre feet, a little slightly over one acre feet um, for the property for the use of development of a park. And, and they're not arguing that. That's not part of it. It's, it's the, the use of that water at this point, even though we have an existing service. So um, they're, they've, They have ter already turned down projects that own the water credits they need just preemptively. They haven't, um, I don't think there's any mistake in the recent decisions of the water district that they really don't care about anyone else or anything else. They're pretty much acting, you know, unilaterally. So in that same vein, um, we should get some information back on what it would take for us to drill our own well on the property. Let them know that. Can, can I ask, do, what's the value of a water credit to us if we can't use them? Uh, that's a, a good question. Um, it seems I mean, to me it affects the consideration that we entered into with the water district for uh, that property, that parcel. Um, so I, I, to me, I, I think that is one of the questions that we should pose to them. It's it's empty value if they're if we um, um, you know made that bargain. Well, just to to clarify the term, we received water offset credits because they have a water offset program that for any development that goes through, you have to pay for improvements in the system to reduce the water demand within the system by the amount you're using. So the net effect on the usage of the system is zero or the demands on the system. So we, we have secured offset credits for one acre feet on the property. I, I can't say that's a water right or anything else or a water use right. It is, it's an offset credit. They're about worth about $18,000 an acre foot right now. Um, you know the challenges the district is facing regarding, you know, overdraft of the aquifer and things like that. So they, you know, they'll still have an offset program, but they, they're looking at just curtailing all development because the offset is not enough uh, to meet their, their ongoing problems. Um, so that's just kind of clarifying the terms. I understand, but I, I think with due respect to what their problems and issues are, I'm just questioning what is the value of the bargain that we struck if they can just say for any project, not necessarily even this project, we can't use it. Um, and, and so, so that's, I mean, I, I think if, if you do run into uh, difficulty with, um, with them that we should maybe look in and address that question in relationship to that transaction. <coughs> Mr. Mayor, Mr. I will yeah, I will point out, you know, our read of all the documents and the rights that the city currently has is different than their staffs at this point. Um, we're working cooperatively with them so that we can try to work through this. Um, obviously, you know, if we need to, we will take all available means to the city possible to exert the rights that we think that we have. Um, in addition, just to put it out there, it's also possible when we looked at this um, that this facility could be done as a waterless park. So it doesn't necessarily doom the project. Um, you know, I have done projects, street projects in the past, where we use water trucks to water the plants to get them established during the first year. Uh, it's not desirable, um, but so there is a fallback. But I think nevertheless, a, there's a water fountain is gotta have a drink pretty drink. low not, yeah. usage. Yeah. Yeah. And, and right. you know, I, Mr. Mayor, if I think what you're alluding to is the fact that they knew the condition they were in when they made the deal with us, and were they, deal, were they negotiating in bad faith, basically, giving us something they never intended to actually give us. We'll, we'll do keep in mind that they haven't said no yet. So we're working through it. We believe that we have the rights. We're working cooperatively with them, and I'm confident that we can come to a... To inspire them. Okay. <laughs> Maybe on a, uh, just another question I have about the access um, and on the design. Maybe if you could bring up um, the, yeah, the layout there. Um, 
Yeah, and I appreciate, the, you know, the kind of the pathway through the center goes all the way to the back end. Uh, will there be, um, or it, this is going to be fenced all the way around, and will there be an access from the other side of uh, that center pathway? There is uh, some p pedestrian um, openings in the split rail fronts, both at this location and at this location. In this location. Okay. Yeah, so people okay. who, if they do decide to walk or ride up, do not have to go all the way down to the parking lot to get in. They're actually going to be here. And actually, this opening, we're going to widen a little bit so and put some bollards okay. in there so that if a public works or another vehicle needs to gain access in this area, we can do that without tearing down the fence. Okay. So, okay. yes, Great. there will be other access. All right. Thank you. Uh, so with that, if there are no other questions on the staff report, I'm going to uh, open it up for the public now that uh, if you would like to address the council on this particular uh, plan uh, for the pump track, dog park, skate park at McGregor. Is there anyone that would like to address the council? Yeah. Out there. Come on. Don't have any skaters out there? Are there any skaters? Are there any bikers out there? Yeah. Come and tell us. Yeah. Just give us a Yahoo. Yeah. Are, are, you, are you happy about this? Is that good? Okay. That's all we wanted to hear. So, um, so with that, I'm going to bring it back to the council for further deliberation and action. I will move the staff recommendation with the um, adjustments to the bidding process that we listed, making all skate park improvements be an additive alternate to the bid. Is there a second? Second. There's a motion and a second. Any further discussion? I, I'm just a little clarification. You're adding in, clarify what you're doing. Oh, what I'm doing is I want, I'd like him to bid it as a base bid that doesn't include any of the skate park work, the paving, grading, things like that, and um, have an alternate for the contractor to bid on should we decide to go for the whole enchilada. Okay. I, we, we didn't, before we were doing the question, I just want to have some discussion on this. It, you made a comment, which I, I wanted to agree with your comment, and that is, I like the layout of the park. I think we should not take away Rob and Peter and Paul to, to divvy it up right just now. I believe your comment that if we build it, they will come. I believe that interest, even though the skate park might be doing a silent protest now, I think that some momentum will, will gain on this, and, and we can be, be a player in that. So I like the concept of leaving the designated areas as they are yes. and pulling them out. And I, I think that we will probably come up with some plan. Um, maybe future items we have on the agenda might free up some money that can uh, can go into a different area. So uh, I just like to leave it intact and pulling out those pieces are fine. But I think that down the road, this will probably gain some interest and we can deal with that. So that was the only comment I wanted to make. Other than that, I support your motion. Okay, thank you, Ed. And, um, and just so everybody knows, this is uh, planned to be construction completed uh, by August of this year, so near the end of summer. Um, and um, the, the work to begin in June, um, I, I think I would also like to add maybe just direct staff that if there is no interest in, uh, from the skate park community that um, you know, maybe this be brought back to us uh, somewhere around that time frame, uh, maybe about June, you know, as the work begins, so that the council has an opportunity to consider maybe expanding the pump track, maybe expanding the dog park uh, at that time. So, yes, Dennis. Just to w add one note is that one key to the success of this property is safe passage from the residential areas in Capitola. So, um, I would like staff to further research on how we can create safe path, at least from New Brighton Middle School, over to this property and what, what it entails and maybe some cooperation with the state parks in between. It would be nice if we had some designated path by the time that, that we open this facility, both for dog walkers and for skaters and bikers. Okay. Thank you. So with that, I'll call the question. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion passes unanimously. Uh, congratulations, everyone. Which will now bring us to uh, the uh, item 10B, which is to consider Lower Pacific Cove parking lot operating guidelines and renaming both the upper and lower Pacific Cove parking lots. The recommended action 
is to approve the guidelines and renaming of the lots. Um, so we'll begin with a staff report. Looks like Steve, you're going to stay here for again. that one. All right. So uh, as, as you're all aware, the uh, parking lot project is nearing completion. We will have it open for parking by the end of this month. There may be a few items uh, to clean up before we, we deem the parking lot complete, but we will be uh, certainly by the summer have a complete project. Upon completion, it is intended to open the uh, lower parking lot uh, for public use on seven days a week. As the city manager mentioned earlier tonight, the Coastal Commission approval was granted yesterday to charge for parking at the existing rate of 50 cents an hour in the parking lot. And I just want to be clear because um, you know, it was part of the, the project and it remains part of the project that the restroom remodel uh, was removed from the current project. Um, we had budgeted about $75,000. Uh, the estimated cost for refurbishing that bathroom came in. And, twice that to three times that amount. Um, and so it was decided to defer that. We are now working with an architect and pursuing options of some prefabricated buildings. Um, a lot of the state parks uh, use these pre prefabricated restroom buildings. Uh, I think the restrooms at Anna Jean Cummings were prefabricated in the county. Um, so, and those look like they can be done um, in the $75,000 to $100,000 range. Um, so that will involve, you know, demoing everything that's there and, and bringing in these prefabricated buildings. So right now, that's something that will have to occur later on and the bathroom project's not included. So you've all seen this. I just want to include it in case there are specific questions about the usage of the lot. Um, I'll run through it really quickly. We have Bay Avenue up here. We will have an entrance and an exit off of Bay Avenue. Uh, we have parking all along. All of the parking in here is done on a porous material for drainage reasons uh, to treat and capture drainage and control the amount of uh, the rate of discharge of the flow to a pre-development rate. Um, so there's parking. All the white areas in here are the parking stalls, which will be on the, on the porous material. Um, here's the restroom location. There is some handicap parking in, in this area. Um, there was a slide repair that was done in this area and coming south we uh, have a small turnaround or roundabout here. Um, being done at the same time, although not part of this project, uh, we took one of the coaches uh, that was in the existing mobile home park and moved it uh, and have completely refurbished it into, it's going to house the parking enforcement uh, team for the police department and also become a storage area for the police department. So that, even though it's not part of this project, it's, it's, it's getting done at the same time because of the necessary of grading and all that. Um, regarding the guidelines and, and regulations, uh, the proposed regulations, guidelines, however you want to call them, um, these are the consistent with what we have with the upper lot. Um, is our recommendation that we continue these guidelines. So those would be paid parking from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, at the rate of 50 cents an hour. No overnight camping, um, although you can't leave a vehicle there overnight. You, just, you can't camp in it. Uh, vehicles must be parked between the white lines. No vehicles over 20 feet in length. Uh, no loitering or skating. Uh, there will be a 72-hour parking limit, so somebody can come and park there for the weekend. Um, they'll have to pay the meter whether during the from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. but stay there for up to 72 hours. Uh, the 72-hour limit is, is consistent with what's done on the rest of the city streets to keep people from storing their vehicles on city property. And kind of the, the general disclaimer of the use of the lot is at a person's own risk and the city capital will not be responsible for damage from the use of the lot. So the name, uh, you know, I've, I know you've all been uh, we've had uh, oral testimony about the name of the lot. Um, in January, the Traffic and Parking Commission recommended that the uh, name be officially changed to Beach and Village Parking Lot 1 and 2. The reason um, we, they recommend continuing to differenti differentiate between the upper and lower lot or 1 and 2 is because there may be some permit parking programs uh, that we could utilize. Uh, for example, we are issuing permits as part of the 
junior guard program that are good in the lower lot or lot number two as we move forward. Um, just the long-term parkers could go down there. Um, it may be something we could do with the uh, employees of village businesses, give them passes for the lower lot. The lower lot is a little further away from the village, so the thought was to do it down there. So that's why we continue to probably differentiate between the two lots. Um, staff believes that this change is a good idea and would clearly identify the parking for what its intended purpose is. And um, the new signage, you know, we're, we're replacing all the signage coming into these parking lots. Um, and here's an example of what we're, we're doing because the object is to try and get people headed to the beach and village to park there. Um, so this is an example of the sign. This, the, this sign right here I think would actually take the place of Councilman Norton's favorite sign behind the police department. Um, the ladies? <laughs> directing people into the, you know, people going to the beach and village, here's where you park. Um, there would be one at the top of uh, both entrances on uh, Bay Avenue and on Park Avenue. And then we have a series of signs. Um, I don't have them in my presentation here. Smaller signs with this message um, coming in on the streets that will replace the, the signs that we have now. So they all have the, the universal parking P arrows and say Beach and Village parking on them, which I think is appropriate. Um, but I I will add, if, if the council chooses not to change the names, the signage within the parking lot can still reflect lower and upper Pacific Hill parking lot. But I, th I th do think it's critical that we identify the signs coming in as beach and village parking. So the recommendations tonight are to approve the, the guidelines um, for the remainder of 2014. And we could come back in January. We'd recommend coming back in January with a report how the usage was. We, um, with the pay stations in place, we'll be able to have a comparison of how much usage we had in the number one lot or the number two lot. And, um, and we can determine if we want to make any changes to the, to the use on, on either lot at that time. And uh, staff recommendation that we approve the change from upper and lower Pacific Hill parking lot to beach and village parking lots one and two, as recommended by the Traffic and Parking Commission. And that's my report. Thank you, Steve. Are there questions? Um, Steve had a question. Um, it sounded like concerning the uh, permit parking that there were going to be differentiated between uh, lot one and lot two. In other words, somebody who maybe um, already has a permit for lot one would have to buy a separate permit for lot two. Um, or if an employee... I think it's more of we're going to give out special permits that are only good in lot two. And I think, you know, the employee permits, um, we may not have thought all this out, but I think that if you have a permit now, I mean, like the village permits are good, all the village residential permits are good in the Pacific Cove lot, and I think they'd be good in either lot. I think it's special permitting programs we're talking about for junior guards, for example, or employees, we see. would just have for the lower okay. lot. Well, I, yeah, I noticed in the regulations and guidelines, and, and full disclosure, I have a permit, okay, because I work in the village and I have a permit for lot one. So, um, but I think it would be good to clarify um, how, and as part of the guidelines, how is that um, going to apply uh, for those who have a pre-existing permit and um, and, for, and for new uh, uh, purchasers. Um, and and just um, w one other question, Dennis, and then I'll... Um, uh, concerning, you said there would be a universal parking fee signage. Um, and I guess I wasn't quite... W as somebody enters, will uh, the um, uh, the price for parking be posted so that they can see that up front and see that it's a lot cheaper than parking in the village. Um, this is the sign we propose to put. Um, it's similar to the signs there that will be at each of the pay station areas. So if, um, let me blow this up a little. So it's, it does specify paid parking for 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. It doesn't have the rate on it um, just because if we change the rate, I don't want to have to go back and change every sign. The no. rate will be part of the, of the pay stations. Um, we do not advertise uh, the difference in parking. We will have some informational brochures about, you know, we have a, a map of parking in the city that will differentiate the different rates uh, for parking in, in, the, in the city. 
So um, this is the intended parking we will, or signage we would have in the parking lots at each mm -hmm. area where there's a pay station. Okay. The, the, it's not a standard practice to post. I mean, usually most places I see they post what the rates are as you go in so people know. It's what usually on the meter. What they're going in. And that's in what, it, like in the individual meters, you, you, it would be posted on the meter and at the pay stations it is, it is, paste, is posted there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Dennis, did you have a question? Yeah. Um, since you're on the box here, Steve, um, circulation. Can you talk about circulation in and out of these parking, this parking lot? Uh, we'll get back to that. So right now, circulation is um, on the lot, has an entrance and an exit at both uh, Capitol Avenue and at Bay Avenue. So you can enter and exit at both lots. The, uh, if you enter at either end, you have to travel through the length of the parking lot, but there are opportunities to turn around um, in both directions and, and go back if you saw a spot somewhere else. Um, Obviously, if you come in down this area, you'd have to go back around the roundabout and back out again. Um, so it is a little more, uh, have better circulation than the upper lot does where you're stuck in one-way um, routes and uh, if you, cars, and, and it's also the very narrow aisleways in the upper lot, so if a car's waiting, you can't get around them. With having two lanes here, uh, you should be able to get around anybody who's waiting for parking. Coming out onto uh, the Bay Avenue, mm -hmm. um, making a left turn there is it can be very difficult. Is it possible we can just do a right turn and direct people over to uh, to uh, to Park Avenue? I mean, certainly that's possible. I've talked with uh, the traffic engineer who kind of looked at the traffic impacts of this um, as part of the uh, coastal development permit process. And although he didn't do a, a detailed analysis of how many cars out, coming out of this lot are going to turn left here, um, his, his feeling was because the intersection of Monterey and Bay is a all-way stop, um, that there should be enough gaps in this direction to get people out of here. Now, if, it, if queuing from this intersection back goes across this intersection, my recommendation is we paint a keep clear on top of this driveway so that, you know, in, when people do what they're supposed to, they'll keep that driveway exit open. And I think there will be enough gaps. I mean, you can turn left there now. If this does begin to queue, I mean, my feeling is we should try it first. I really don't okay. think it's going to be dangerous. Um, if the queuing here becomes a problem, obviously people could turn around. There's room for them to turn around and get back out. Um, what do you mean by that? Well, if, so if this is four cars are queued back to here, the fifth car can decide to go out Capitol Ave. He's not stuck waiting here. The, the first couple cars may be stuck, but after that, okay. um, they'll be able to get out. Is so there any way to open that vision line farther than it is? It's well, we did, we did raise the grade on this exit here before it was a steep, and as you came out of it, you had a hard time um, visioning. We have leveled the top of this out um, so that you can do have a, your up higher as you're sitting in your car looking for it and um, you know we could the vision line going in this direction uh, is, is not bad and we could certainly look at if I'm not sure what the red curb situation is here I don't think there's any parking between here and this driveway and beyond that driveway I don't think there's any parking in this block of uh, Bay Avenue so I don't really think that vision is going to be a problem given that we're at a higher elevation when we're sitting in our car now. Okay. Um, my other question is regarding um, three-quarters of the year, our, our existing parking lot is not full. So in reality, we don't need this parking lot three-quarters of the year. Would it not be more economical and better for management if we close one of the two parks during those three-quarters of the year where we don't need them? I think that's something that experience will tell us, um, and certainly we know that you know, we don't need all this parking in the middle of winter, and that would be uh, something. I think that's why we want to come back and review the uses, uh, or the council can establish that now. But I think that certainly this lower portion, because um, this is a police service building, mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe we do a closure here. I don't think we'd want to you know, close it off here. 
uh, we could close off there. Those are, are certainly options we could consider, uh, and, and you're right. We don't expect these lots to be full uh, year-round. So what you're suggesting now is, is that we look at things for a period through the summer and see how the yeah, it operates. Well, it, it yeah. isn't, we'd have to go longer now because we're looking at, we're looking at the busy time of year. Uh, my suggestion is through the calendar year of 2014. For the calendar. We, we take a look at it and, and see what kind of, we know during the summer, I think we'll have cars in and out of both lots. Okay. But you're right, in the winter, we can come back and, and reevaluate it. Okay. Now, the lighting, Steve, what, what, um, what do we have out there and what control do we have as far as glowing up into the neighbor's houses? So and when will, they be on, when will they be on all night long or will they? They will be on all night long, um, just like they are in the Pacific, the upper lot. Mm -hmm. um, they are downcast lighting um, and, you know, should be a minimal impact to, to the residents. Obviously, they're going to see an illuminated area, but they won't have lights uh, shining in their property. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, Mike. Well, well with the... Uh, pay stations that we'll have throughout the rest of this year, I think it's time for us to get a really accurate count of how well both lots do. And because I, I still hear people say, why are we building another parking lot? The upper lot's only full four days a year. And I live a block away and I look at that parking lot all the time, especially this year with a lack of rain. That parking lot is briskly used all through this last winter. So I'd really like to know when, we, when it comes back to us, what kind of usage we get on a, you know, lot one, lot two, or throughout the year? Well, I, I know it's full during Wharf to Wharf. I know that it's full, um, you know, for Begonia Festival. I know it's full for Art and Wine. When else, you know, how? One, what's one our judge level? we might have for that, Mike, is the revenue itself. Well, we well, would know what the revenue change is. Uh, right, and yeah. you know, I want to get an idea of you know what kind of, you know, flow we have. And you know, I agree. Once we know what the patterns are. We'll know what we need to deal with. Um, and a question for the chief, and and I, I kind of can answer my own question, and that is we have a, a police facility at the bottom of that lot, so we're, there's going to be a police presence down there. I'm concerned that, you know, it's it's a heavily monitored lot, so we don't have any nefarious activities going on there. Parking lots can draw that. So I'm sure this will be the favorite drive through and secret hiding place for police watching the four-way stop <laughs> over the top. Not str I'm sorry, not secret, strategic place to park. There will be activity there, w especially with our parking enforcement officers and uh, the storage that we're going to be using there. So there is going to be some presence. Again, right where it curves to the right, we're not going to be able to see back. But it's going to be an area that we will consistently patrol, just like Jade Street Park and the other parks that we do have. Great. And, and I'd also like to see after we get these, and I noticed no vehicles over 20 feet, after we get this usage throughout the year, it would be nice to have some designated bus parking spots. Um, maybe not in the lower section, it's a little chopped up, but perhaps the upper one, the long sections, because I've heard from tour companies that frequent our, our fair city that their biggest challenge is where to go after they drop off their 50 visitors. That's certainly a possibility. I think m uh, concerns with the upper lot is it's so narrow. The driveways up there are so narrow. I'm not sure you could get a, a long bus through there, but it's something we can look at and All right. we know there's a need. Thanks. I have nothing else. Thank okay. You. Thank you. Yes, sir. <coughs> Quick question. Steve, you mentioned I know there was some kind of a plan that if we wanted to close off the, the lot. There, there is going to be a gate up at the top at Bay Avenue, or is there not? There is not. We certainly we have no plans to be able to close it off at this point. At, at this point, there's no gates being constructed as part of the project. As part of the project, pretty simple to build if we want to build them. Um, and we can also, you know, if we're doing a temporary closure, we have lots of barricades. So, but at this point, no, we do not have a metal gate that opens and closes. Okay, so I wasn't sure. If the, I know we had talked. Well, I know we had talked about possibly closing it at certain times, and but there's no plans for any gate at this time. Logically, it would be. Past the roundabout and maybe up at the top, though, that would be because police. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, maybe it's somewhere in the middle here. I think we need, you know, some police parking for them to do right. their businesses in there. There are four spots here, but I think most of those are uh, handicapped spaces. So somewhere in here, maybe it's at the corner. We can, and certainly we could do it at, at Bay Avenue. So. 
And, and do keep in mind that, you know, there's a real yin and yang to keeping the parking lot open and closed. You know, when it's open, hopefully we have people going through, which hopefully doesn't, you know, keeps a limit on nefarious activity. Sure. Um, it may ultimately turn out that there's times when it is easier to close it and it does work out better, but it may be that if we close it, the only people back there are people that, that are looking for a hideout. So I think it is something we need to monitor, and we, we're going to get great usage data with all these parking meters and the data that comes out of them. So we should have a real good picture for how many people are using it and when and what the, what the best plan is after mm -hmm. a year's worth of data. Great. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask a question about the naming, and particularly, uh, well, first of all, the, between one and two, uh, will the parking spaces be numbered, um, um, you know, distinctly or uh, consecutively? Yes. Or, okay. So, I mean, I, I don't remember the number, but I think we start at 500 in the upper lot and go through 700 and something or other, and down there, I think we are, uh, we skip about 20 different numbers before we start there, and it goes up to 900 and something. So, yes, the, uh, okay. there's so no repeat in the numbers. And, and you'll be able to pay for any of the spaces actually in the city at any pay station. So they all are individually numbered. Okay. And I was just curious about why uh, the Traffic and Parking Commission, because um, it seems like they did uh, discuss the concept of lower and upper, which to me is more intuitive than one and two. Um, because it seems to me people would like, well, which one's one and which one's two? I, I don't quite know. Um, w were, were you a part of that process, Steve? Did you kind of get an understanding? I mean, some of the emails I got, it says, well, they discussed that, but they uh, opted for one and two instead. And I think it was um, more if you're not part, you don't know the geography of them, upper and lower doesn't mean a whole lot. Um, once you're there, it makes a little more sense, but uh, from a mm -hmm. familiarity standpoint, um, you know, the upper is uh, above a structure and the lower is the lower part of the structure, and, and so they thought just um, not using the upper lower because they happen to be geographically mm -hmm. separated, that one and two serve that function better. Okay, thank you. Yes, any other questions? Yes, yeah. I got another one question too. Um, it sounds like we we taken in a, a concept to accommodate for the junior guards and they're using that facility there for are they they're talking about drop off or are they talking about just where mothers no our, away? our goal here is I mean, um, is to try and get some of the the junior guard parents out of the village and and as far as their parking as far as their okay. parking yeah okay, yeah. okay. Um, we have a program now that requires a certain number of permits. That, are, that need to be taken or paid for by the merchants down in the village. But it does not require that every employee have a parking permit. Would that be a consideration where if you have a business down there or you, or you have employees, you're required, we, we have a control, of, we already know the number of employees because we have business licenses and we have that facility. Since, since this, this contribution by this community is really to the benefit, the highest benefit is the merchants in the village or, or visitors to the village, let's say that one way that would help us in paying for it and also help the neighborhoods in keeping uh, employees from parking our neighborhoods, which to me, that I see that more than I see visitors coming to my neighborhoods, mostly employees, is that if we required every merchant to buy a parking pass for a year for every employee that they have, you would get employees, employees don't have to pay for the parking in there, then they're, then they're going to park there. If, the reason they park it up in my neighborhood or the surrounding neighborhoods is because of the fact that they don't have to pay there. So it should be a consideration in, in far as uh, the financing of this parking structure, which we're trying to get people to park in, and also in the financing of a future facility there, that, that the, the merchants and the businesses there contribute in that way in paying for the the Every employee should have a parking pass, and it should be paid for by by the merchants and not the city. As uh, I believe our, our permit parking program is is part of our LCP, so I mean we take an amendment to our permit parking program to do that as something, but it's certainly something that the Traffic and Parking Commission is talked about is getting the employees to park there and incentivizing ways to get them to park there and, and mainly to get them out of the, the residential Well, I think if space. they had a parking permit, that would right. make it, that would get them out of the neighborhoods. Yeah, yeah. So, so um, we, we'd be happy to, to look into that and what's involved okay. in that. Um, from the uh, 
from the employer's standpoint, you know, I know some of the restaurants there have hundreds of employees because they all work small shifts. So um, how we deal that, I'm not sure we want to give out that many permits. Um, but well, it's something have we'd have to look into. They would be buying. They're parking somewhere. No matter how many employees have, they're parking somewhere. Mm -hmm. So the, the point is, is, is that if they had parking permits and they have to buy them, that's just part of being an employer down there. Right. We're not asking for a parking district, which almost every jurisdiction, including the city of Santa Cruz, makes, the, makes those businesses pay for the parking structures. In this case, the city and the residences committee are picking up the tab on this thing. That seems like a pretty small contribution in my eyes to, to making this thing work. Okay. Thank you. Okay, any other questions on the staff report? Um, um, with that, I'll um, open it up to the public. Is there any member of the public that would like to address the council on this item? Good evening. Long time no chat. Uh, my name is Nels Westman. I am the chair of your Traffic and Parking Commission. Um, as regards naming the staff report pretty much nails the recommendation of the commission. And while I agree that the name Beach and Village Parking Lot 1 or 2 is slightly long, it is clearly descriptive and it clearly communicates that it serves both the village and the beach. And I think this is important to communicate to visitors to our community. Uh, no doubt locals and staff will quickly come up with a working contraction that will get the job done. My guess Lot one, lot two. The commission has also started some brainstorming on strategies for the smart utilization of both lot one and lot two to leverage the additional parking to protect nearby residential neighborhoods, to help village employees, to improve shuttle bus operations while at the same time building the critical revenue streams that will someday make a permanent parking solution a reality. And I uh, just um, offhand want to respond to Dennis's suggestion that we close the parking lot for three quarters of the year. That really seems quite counterintuitive to me. And it also seems that all of the people that have uh, invested well over a million dollars in creating this temporary facility, we're kind of getting shortchanged if we're only allowed access to it for one quarter of the year. So I would definitely um, urge the council to go slowly on the concept of closing that parking lot. If just one or two or three cars park in it, uh, that's better than, than them going and parking in, uh, in the neighborhood. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nels. Anyone else? Good evening. I'm Jim Cavanaugh. I live on Pilgrim Drive just above the parking lot. And I thought you'd like to know the parking light, light the lights are on. They came on a couple of days ago. And uh, in terms of keeping me awake at night, they don't, actually. The lights work, I think, as they're supposed to, and they cast all the light downward. And actually, you thought I was going to complain, right? <laughs> um, the only light that really shines, we have a two-story two -story house on the hill above there, and the only light that we get is actually reflected off the pole. There's no light coming from the light fixture itself. All the light from the fixture goes down, and it's really not a bother. <coughs> um, but I did have a question. Um, I, our, I wrote an email about this, and then the city manager answered it, but uh, it, was due to, it was about the temporary nature of this parking structure. And they strung all these electric wires overhead, and virtually no construction has done in the past, what, 10 or 20 years, where the electric wires are not put underground. And the electric wires are overhead because this is a temporary parking structure. And I was wondering how temporary this parking structure is and what the additional cost would have been to put the wires underground, just because they look really tacky. Yes. Yeah, how temporary is it, Dennis? <laughs> One year. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I think that time frame temporary, I mean, in uh, government terms, um, could be um, uh, extensive. Um, five to ten years, uh, or it could be um, as short as Dennis um, uh, thinks it may be, one year. I think what it turns on, the, the grand uh, plan is to build a, a structure on the upper parking lot. I believe that's number one. Correct. Good. Um, 
So once that structure is built, uh, then the lower lot would be available for another use. All those, that infrastructure would come out if in fact it was going to be turned into a park. The, um, also the time frame is, is uh, tied to is going to be affected by how quickly uh, the developer of the old Capitola Theater lot uh, may build a hotel. If he moves quickly, uh, you may see a, a structure uh, go up there within a shorter time frame um, than five to ten years. So, you know, it is a um, uh, kind of loose term, um, and it's really, I think, up to the will of the community here as to how quickly they want to be able to build that uh, uh, second structure. Now in terms of what the additional cost would have been to put the uh, utilities underground, uh, do we, Steve, do you have a figure on that? I think it's, um, if I was about $30,000 actually. We, we did do a design element that included underground <coughs> all the mm -hmm. wires and, uh, and then uh, based on those pricing and, and price of the whole project in our budget, that was one of the items we eliminated. It was about thirty thousand right. dollars. Well, that and then and also the remodeling the the restroom there. Right. Yeah. Um, so I think that those are the justifications for why uh, the utilities were not put underground. They don't look very good. It's unfortunate. I I agree. Good. And and you know and you're right. They don't. But you know if they don't look good anywhere, and there are everywhere in this community still um, and and hopefully it will drive us to really try to work harder to turn that ultimately in, into what uh, we as a community want it to finally be. Um, so yeah, we don't, we don't have that, uh, uh, the unsightly poles there. Well, I'm good with that as long as you don't build the $10 million parking structure by using a parcel tax. Uh, when n n yeah. No, I mean, well, even if that uh, were to be proposed by a future council, we would have to go to the vote of the residents to be able to accomplish that. And so, again, it's the will of the public that's going to drive this. So thank you for coming and, and, and speaking to us this evening. Uh, is there anyone else that would like to address us? And so, what's... <laughs> Uh, James Wallace, 608 Gilroy Drive, Capitola. Um, I was a member of the GPAC, the G, you know, um, the new general plan that you guys. I think I think the planning commission passed it, and I just wanted to remind everybody that um, in the general plan, um, first of all, I want to say we're really glad to see the council and the parking commission work together to get this temporary parking lot up and going. It's something we really needed, so it's good to see government working like that, and that's great. I just want to remind the council that the overall feeling from the general plan, and it's in the general plan, from all the public meetings we had at Jade Street, the community really wants to see that eventually turn to open space sooner than later. So let's not lose, and if I was hearing the mayor's story say, hey, maybe even having those ugly wires up there will get it done quicker. So <laughs> so then remind you guys, Let's get a plan going, a strategy to see how we can finance the next phase of this. Because when you walk that property, it'd be a real shame to see it just just a parking lot. And, um, it's a it's a wonderful asset for the community. It's right in the center of town. It could be used for so many things, and the community could decide that down the road. So. Um, from what you from what the council is saying tonight, I'm encouraged to hear everybody saying, well, you know, it's. I hope it's not five to ten years. I'd rather see it be three to five years, hopefully. I think that's realistic. But are you going to have a, a team or a financiers that could show you how it, how it could pencil out, how we could pay for it? Is there plans to get that together, to have you know, the experts look at putting the pencil on and saying, if two and two make five, can we afford this thing? So please... Uh, Please get that together because the community would really benefit from having that eventually revert back to open space. And uh, we have the risk and it's supposed to be open space, but the community is really not allowed to use it. So I'd hate to see another beautiful place of Capitola be turned into a place where you're just going to park your car and 
when it could be used for such a better thing. So all in all, good luck. And uh, with the junior guard parents, um, have you talked with them, Steve, about a strategy to get the moms to use that? Well, I, um, I actually was involved in that, putting that together, but I do know that yeah, they are, as parents sign up for junior guards, they are issuing the permit and, and telling them. Because the one thing, permit. like the little, the little guards, and the, the instructors, because when my kids did it, they used to walk them to the top of the hill up above the wharf and encourage them to park there. No mom is going to let her kid walk through the village when there are only the little guards right. up to the parking lot or somewhere else to meet them. But if the instructors, obviously you probably know this, already offer to walk them back up as part of the deal, then you'll have success as long as they know their kids are safe being escorted from the beach to the drop-off point. It would work. If the kids are supposed to walk by themselves, they probably say, no, I'm going to go pick my kid up. Anyway. No, we are working with the, with right. the recreation. But all in all, good job, Council, for getting this and to the Parking Commission for getting this temporary parking lot uh, done. And uh, let's move on to get a permanent parking solution and return that to the open space. Thank you. Thank you, James. Is there anyone else that would like to address the Council? Seeing none, I'm going to close the microphone and we'll bring it back to the council for deliberation and uh, action. Who would like to begin? I, I don't have a lot to say about it. A lot of work has been done ahead of us. Um, it does warrant consideration at the end of this year. I suppose Beach and Village Parking 1 and 2 is as good a name as any. We could... Uh, you know, the mind reels of the number of parking lot naming jokes I can come up with. I won't even start because I'll never stop. Um, so I'd have to just go along with the staff recommendation and parking <coughs> and traffic recommendation. And I see that I'm glad to see that, that is the motion. And okay. uh, by the way, I'm glad to see that there's an in and an out, both at the top and the bottom. Very important. Very good. Um, and I guess it remains to be seen what's going to happen at the top because I would agree with Dennis. Uh, I'm holding my breath in the left turn up there. But I'm willing to wait and see. Yeah, I, I do think we'll add a, a keep clear up there based on that, and uh, I think that'll help. But I agree, if it, it's a problem, we should we'll come right back and address it. And we certainly need to hear from the the folks that live the close to the park. Should there be, um, you know, disruptions down there that changes the quality? I mean, I'm all in favor, as we all are, of getting the cars out of the neighborhood and improving the life in the neighborhoods. I also don't want to create a problem that degrades the quality of life or in close proximity to the parking lot. So I'll, I'll second that motion. I have a few comments, though. Okay. There's a motion and a second. Why don't you go ahead with your comments? Uh, first of all, I want, to, I want to thank Mr. Cavanaugh for coming and, and sharing your uh, honest comments that were, I do feel were constructive. Um, just I think one thing that is important to us is that it is – designated to be a temporary parking lot. And because of that, I think we valued not putting any more money than possible in there. And the $30,000 was, we wanted to think of as a significant savings. Um, with regards to the parking lot, I think uh, a lot of work has been done by the Traffic and Parking Commission. Uh, we're, we're excited about this lot because the first thing we're trying to do is just make it a test to see if it's gonna handle the parking circulation problems that we know we've had for many, many years. So I think we just need to let the park happen. I'm not really willing, like Mike said, to do a lot of changes right now. I just, I think it's a great plan. Everything that's designed, uh, let it work. You know, I, I, I'm not sure that I agree that three quarters of the year it's not gonna be used. I, I think uh, when this thing opens in, looks like it's gonna open in May, I, I can see, I do the months, May, June, July, August, September, October, at least six months are gonna be, with the weather we have, it's going to be viable. When we, I think the suggestion was to evaluate it till till uh, to the end of the year, and I think that's a great concept. What we do in January, February, March with that lot, I think I'm open to that. You know, uh, we've talked about other uses to use it, but I think right now it should be for parking. Um, with regards to making any changes, I think the keep clear might be a good suggestion. You know, I mean, that, I'll leave that up to you. I think we can see what works and doesn't work, and I'd rather take that posture, you know, whether we need to put up gates or anything else like that. Uh, I think it's a great plan. Uh, it's going to definitely, I hope, I'm not going to say definitely, I hope it's going to relieve the parking in the neighborhood. I think one of the big problems we have is that people resisted coming to Capitola just because of the parking. So 
I don't want to say that it's not going to be used because maybe, hopefully, we're going to have more people come here. We're going to have a place to park them. They're not going to park on Park Avenue. They're not going to park over on Riverview. They're going to they're going to use the lot. Uh, the rates are certainly cheap enough, um, so I, I support uh, the recommendation and go with staff recommendation, and I like the project, and I think it's great. Dennis? Maybe we can make the, uh, the polls out there a project of the Arts Commission. Totem poles? Um, so there's got to be some cosmetic they carved. Carved. They could be carved. <laughs> or at least painted. <laughs> um, it's Dark color. It's not hidden my feeling on this parking lot, and it breaks my heart to look and see what we've done down there. But um, I can't turn back the clock. I have to deal with it and make it operate the best I can with the situation. Um, I, I would like to see some uh, a movement forward by the city and the city council and putting together a program of, of financing our parking situation and, and moving towards um, a permanent parking structure on the upper lot as We've seen directed by our GPAC, our, our tra traffic and circulation committee, and this council speaking for it, that um, I think now is the time to start um, and direct, direct our city manager to start looking at means of funding and what methods we have and what, what can be done to, to finance this long term. And again, I, I, I fall to, to time in, in a hotel or, or um, other improvements coming in the city that would help pay for that. that um, that it's not too it's not too soon to do that, and that if we want to see something within the two to five year period that we're talking about, we really need to start now. And also, it helps us in plan for other other facilities and how we use them in our community. Um, it, it, the the thing that bothers me the most, we had a, actually with this park down below, we had a solution to our Jade Street Park situation, and we let that go by. We still have the problem with the Jade Street Park situation where we don't own the property. And we have to negotiate to even use it. This could have been our park. But w we've made that move now, and, and I will continue to lobby, even after off this council, to m turn that property into a park. And I th I've heard from this community, large and, large and cloud, and I will take it to a vote of the community if I have to, that we will turn that property on that lower par parking lot there into a park someday. And those are my statements. And if, if you gave me a choice of names of the park, can I have one? Oh, okay. Okay. Okay, uh, the, the transient overflow temporary parking, parking park soon to become the Pacific Cove Park within five years. Is that too long a sentence that's to a go to put a sign? That's a big <laughs> sign. <laughs> okay, that's all I have to say. Thanks, Sam. Thank you, Dennis. And um, one, I, I want to congratulate staff and everyone here, the, uh, everyone at the uh, uh, Traffic and Parking Commission for all your hard work in making this happen. Um, I, I think this is a significant uh, achievement uh, by all of us, um, and uh, I look forward to when we have the ribbon cutting um, on this new parking lot. Um, however, um, I do feel, I mean, just building it is not going to be enough. We need to um, start developing um, the, the signage uh, and having creative ways of, a, of getting people uh, to be aware of where it is and to actually go over there and use it in park and not drive around the village, not continue to drive through the neighborhoods. And I think that that, that is a, a, going to be a function of ongoing education, ongoing engineering, um, and, uh, and other you know, creative methods. So I hope that uh, the Traffic and Parking Commission will continue to look at that, um, develop the shuttle program there, um, so uh, that we can get full utilization. Um, and, and I do fear, I, mean, I think that we would kind of undercut people's uh, habits of using it if we were to close it and open it, close it and open it. Um, and I think we, what we want to do is get people to be aware of it, uh, to get people to use it on a regular basis. Um, and so that is going to be an ongoing effort. I also agree with Dennis uh, that we need to start, as soon as this uh, parking lot is open, um, we need to start, and I, I would like to include in the motion, directing staff to start uh, analyzing and evaluating um, how we finance uh, the construction of the upper lot um, structure. Um, because even if you're going to do it within five years, the work needs to start now. 
uh, to be able to do that. And so uh, we should uh, start to proceed on that, develop some track and should develop some momentum. Uh, and develop some excitement among the community about what this could potentially become uh, because that's where you're going to gain the will uh, and where you have the will, the finances will follow. Um, and so I, I would um, certainly support you and Dennis. Uh, I'll be long off the council by that time that happens, but at least I would hope that um, you know I was a part of making that uh, into a, a re really jewel of an I mean, I would like to see it as open space as a park. Um, I, I'm not going to dictate the future councils of the community about ultimately what they want to do with that property, but um, that would be my vision. Um, so if the maker of the motion is uh, amenable to that amendment yes. uh, to it, thank you. And the second as well. Yes. I appreciate it. And so uh, uh, I think enough talking. So uh, all in favor of the motion? Aye. 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 And motion passes unanimously. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for coming this evening and speaking to us. Which will bring us to uh, item C, which is uh, design. Th this must be Steve Knight. Is, that, <laughs> is this what's going on here? Um, consider finalizing the design and funding for the Esplanade and Stockton Avenue intersection improvements and authorize advertising the project for construction bids. The recommended action is to approve the Esplanade and Stockton Avenue's intersection um, uh, improvements uh, and to authorize the uh, advertising of the project for construction. Uh, Steve, take it away. Once again, good evening. Um, the council actually uh, initiated this project or approved some plans uh, in February for this project. Fortunately, as we've uh, delved into some of the details a little farther, we, we've found it necessary to make some changes. And then in addition to that, um, there's been discussion of uh, potentially trying to encourage more cooperative public-private funding for sidewalk improvements in the village, uh, which have a direct bearing on, on the scope of work on this project. So tonight, we're, we're going to kind of talk about all sorts of details with this project and try and finalize the scope of what we go out to bid with. Uh, what gets constructed now, maybe some, what gets delayed, and, and try and move forward. So the, the minor revisions that were included in the plan sheet that's in, in your agenda packet is uh, new ADA guidance, I wouldn't call them regulations, uh, encourage uh, ADA ramps at the corners to be separate so that you don't have one that kind of spits you out and you go either direction. They line with the crosswalk, so we have done that. Uh, we uh, have a separate ramp uh, for each direction of the sidewalk. We've uh, changed the bulb out to include an in-ground planter. Um, originally, we had planned to just use the pots there, and I think the thought was it would make more sense to have an in-ground planter, probably still utilize a couple of the pots there, but that's a pretty minor change. And then um, there was request to look at potentially widening the sidewalk on the eastern side of Stockton Avenue. And we have facilitated that, um, although it does in involve uh, potentially removing a, one of the, a single 24-minute parking zone uh, in that spot. Um, possible scope change of the work, like I mentioned, is uh, w whether we want to consider removing all the sidewalk reconstruction from this project, just focus on the crossing improvements so that we can seek to facilitate cooperative public-private funding. And this is really evolves from the Esplanade uh, sidewalk project, which uh, we're 95 percent complete with at this point, where we've partnered with all the property owners of the restaurants along the Esplanade um, and, and essentially split the cost of uh, widening and putting a new sidewalk in that area. And the thought is, um, do we want to try and continue those efforts uh, for other sidewalks throughout the village? Um, we have had interest expressed to us um, by at least three property owners, um, properties in the village that they want to, uh, are interested in, in doing a similar type project. Um, one of them includes part of the sidewalk on this project. Others are on Capitol Avenue. So there, there's interest out there uh, from other property owners of, of getting 
you know, improving the sidewalks in the village um, and they're willing to help pay for it. So um, the thought here is we would, if we wanted to remove that funding or remove that scope from this project, it would obviously reduce the cost to below uh, what we have budgeted for the project and we can then set that money aside and, and come forward with uh, improvement plans as property owners are uh, approach us. Um, the sidewalk replacement projects then would probably, or I would say certainly would, would take place in the fall. It's not something we really would want to take under the summer. And that's what I've been telling a lot of the property owners. So to review the, the in design of and the concepts of the uh, project, it takes two crosswalks that currently across, go across Stockton Avenue and combines them into one. Um, it widens the sidewalk along the eastern side, eastern side of Stockton Avenue by 18 inches. It eliminates one 24-minute parking space. It constructs a median protection area in the middle of the new crosswalk. It narrows the vehicle lanes through the crosswalk, which um, does a great deal to slow down traffic. And it formalizes the bulb out currently defined by potted plants by building a raised bulb out. And the, and, and the raised bulb out is more than just defining it, it allows us to uh, provide the ADA ramp so we can move the crosswalks around. Here's the design um, document that's in your agenda packet. So you can see we um, have the separate ADA ramps for each sidewalk. Currently, um, as we know, this is the sidewalk that uh, we will be eliminating across this breach. As you know, it's, it's unprotected. It crosses through three um, traffic lanes. And the idea here is we combine it into one that has a short crossing to a protected area and another short crossing across the next lane. Um, the sidewalk we're talking about, this sidewalk is all rather old and deteriorated. 95% uh, of it is one property owner uh, of, the, of this building at the corner here. Uh, this property owner has expressed uh, interest in considering a, a, a cooperative project to help us pay for it. Um, timing of it is a little difficult and that's what we're, we're working on and we, we may want to consider removing it from this project. There's also sidewalk uh, along here. Um, that property owner has been approached uh, and uh, right now we're, we're still working with them. Uh, they have not expressed an interest in, in, in cooperating. Um, so if we pull that out, it makes this project a little difficult to build in this area, but I, I do think we could do it. Um, and let's see, so the median island separated crosswalks. The planter will be in this area. Um, we'll do a combination of low uh, drought tolerant uh, uh, vegetation in here with uh, one or two uh, palm trees, would, I think is the, the idea. It would be something that will be planted by public works crews after this is constructed. Unfortunately, um, there's a, a recent development in the like last day uh, on this project. The Coastal Commission has notified the city that this project does require a coastal development permit. I know both the city manager and, uh, city, and the city attorney and uh, community development director have had lots of conversations with them about it and they can certainly talk to it better than I can. But I think the direction uh, we're recommending at this point is we, rather than uh, fight the Coastal Commission at this point, uh, is that we uh, do uh, go through the permit process and make a, a uh, application that would be considered by the uh, Planning Commission at this point. We do that concurrently while we're out to bid on the project. Um, the project doesn't need to go to the Coastal Commission um, for approval. It's just it needs a coastal development permit. That can then get, if it's approved by the Planning Commission or not approved, it can be appealed to the City Council. Ultimately, that decision could be appealed to the Coastal Commission if it, if it went that far. So if, if you know all the approvals go through and there's no appeals, um, it can be done pretty quickly. So my recommendation uh, tonight is to approve the design modifications and finalize the scope of work, mainly regarding the inclusion of the sidewalks. Direct staff to submit an application the, for a coastal development permit for consideration by the Planning Commission. 
and provide direction to staff on the creation of a village sidewalk replacement cooperative project. And that's the end of my report. The questions? Dennis. If I'm not mistaken, the village master plan had a coastal permit. This is part, this is the area that's encompassed in the village, in the master plan. I actually don't think the master plan was formally adopted by the council. It was approved. The slow, the slow street plans was? The, the project, the 2000 project on Capitol Avenue was approved and it came out of that, but uh, my research indicates that there was no formal adoption of the entire master plan because it included one, you know, reversing the direction on Esplanade and, and things like that. So I mean, I'd be happy to look at it again, but I'm pretty sure that okay. That, okay. as a concept, it was okay. I could be wrong. Um, the, um, the, the face in this development now, Steve, is, is, that, is that without having cooperation of the adjacent property owners that you're, you're putting that, at least the sidewalk work off till Till fall, is that correct? But can you go ahead and do the can you go ahead and do the crosswalk now and the bulb out? Yeah, we could do the bulb out because the bulb out's part of the street, and we could do the ADA ramps, um, which would be required as part of this. Um, and that would be my in the landscaping and the street lighting. There are street lights I failed to mention in that that we could put in. So that would be our recommendation if we don't okay. want to proceed. Okay. And when can you do that? It's going to be, it's uh, unfortunately with all the, the delays, it's going to be a summertime project, but I really think we could, you know, build the bulb out and all, and, and all that quickly and with minimal impacts, certainly minimal impacts to pedestrians in the area, um, traffic impacts, we can do our best to mitigate. What, what would be the impact if we just put the whole project out and did it all at once in, in fall? I mean, what, I know, I know we, we, we don't improve a dangerous intersection at that point, but... If we, I'm I sorry, can't. If I can't picture being tearing this thing out in the summertime. And so if we put it off, on, if we put, put the whole project off till, till fall. Yeah, you know, we live with what we've had for for many years now, and until yeah. then, and, and you know by then we, uh, we have a we can work good out pricing and, and and get it done quickly in the fall. The the property owner, um, uh, Mr. Dwyers, who owns the, I guess it's called the Polar Bear now. I want to call it Violette. Um, they have in indicated an interest of potentially moving forward more quickly. Um, you know, we've talked about, we've said that if we were going to do the project and they were going to reimburse us, we'd need to be talking about a fall schedule at this point. They've indicated that if we have plans and specs, they may be interested in building it and having us reimburse them uh, and having us inspect it. And they think they may be able to do it more quickly. So that that is, that is there's one scenario in which we could get all the work done. Um, coming into the summer, but you know the the urgency I think you know is 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 not. It's been this way for a long time, so I do think we could live with it through the summer. If we we're in the to. middle of Easter week now. There really isn't a long break between now and, and and summertime. It may be better just to put this thing off until we have everything away. We have agreements with the other end of the sidewalk, which we don't have agreement on. Um, that would be the north. Is that the north end? North end of the sidewalk. Yeah, and then. And then um, you say David Ling is there's a possibility of getting David Ling also. I, I have Newman actually wants not to heard from it. him. I've heard from other property owners, uh, the Trestle Building and across the street from the Trestle Building. Well, it sure would be nice if we could just get a program. We did it all at once and instead of breaking this thing up. And you know, along these lines, one thing we could look at, and I know lighting is there, is we could look at if we could add a street light, even in the existing configuration. Well, that would be good. Street light, street light would really summer. help. Yeah. Can we get one on the other side of Stockton exactly. Bridge also? That's on the other side of both sides of Stockton Bridge the, because the crosswalk at the um, Venetian side of Stockton Bridge mm -hmm. is hazardous every night. We could certainly look at that. Yeah, we could take that direction tonight and, and try and get new street lights put in. And also, <clears throat> and I, and I want to give credence to, you know, one of the neighbors who brought up some good points, uh, you know, not taking away the crosswalk. I can't go along with that because it's truly a safety issue. It has been anyone who lives here sees people peeking around the left-hand turners trying to get across that crosswalk. But there are some good points here, and um, we are not, how can I say this and still respect public works? Okay. We're not the best island builders in the world. <laughs> we have priors. Um, how good do you feel about that island with respect to John's comments about emergency vehicles, right turns into the Esplanade, um, and do we want to consider that, you know, constructing perhaps 
you know, a bolt down temporary island before we pour a lot of concrete? Or do we want to risk the Capitola jackhammer slash island? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just rubbing it in now. It's just terrible. You know my question. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I share a, an aversion to medians um, <laughs> based on past experience. So I, I agree. Um, you know, one, one option would be to, rather than with a face curb, is to use a roll curb. Certainly emergency vehicles can get over on that. Um, the right turn into S1, I, I mean, that's a pretty big wide turn as it is now. I don't think that'll be affected. Um, I think it's the, the best way to, to, you know, address the pedestrian crossings here. I mean, even on Capitol Road where we were infamous now, um, the medians there that we settled on are doing exactly what they want. They provide right. a protected area for people to cross. Agreed. Um, Do you think the rolled curbs, uh, and I'm thinking primarily with emergency vehicles, the fire department feels good about that narrow chute that they're going to run because they're, the engine runs across Stockton Bridge four times a day, easily. Um, it's ample space. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it meets their requirements um, and, and from, from lane width. Um, if there's cars stopped in there, you know, they, and they, they're trying to get around, certainly that could be, uh, provide some, some issue. But, uh, um, you know, similar to other traffic calming projects, it, it is a balance between uh, emergency access and, and, and pedestrian safety. Uh, and last question. Um, do the rolled curbs provide less uh, safety for the pedestrian? Well, they'll still be, you know, I don't think a, a normal vehicle is comfortable driving up even on a rolled curb. I mean, I don't think it's something people are going to be riding up on to, and, and going. So, uh, yeah, I think they still would provide protection. I wasn't thinking about intentional riding up on the rolled curb. Well, I was thinking of <laughs> um, wild rides out of the village. You know. Yes, and they would probably go up on a regular curb, too, then. Well, okay, there's that. How wild they are, I guess. But I, I think the degree of protection maybe is slightly less, but I still think it's, it, it's significant. And I would be willing to go along with the delay. I, I certainly understand that. But not if it has to come back to us again. You know, we keep on deciding on this. And it would be nice to not see this again if we delay it <coughs> till, till the fall. But that's just me. Yeah. Question. Uh, Steve, is the footprint of the bulb out in the same place where the, pi the, the, the poles that are in the street now, is it... It, it changes ever so slightly. I don't think uh, the the curvature of this isn't exactly what's out there, but we've curved it out so that it lines up better with the wider sidewalk here. But 98% of it is as it is today. That, that was my impression. And, and, you know, with regard to the questions brought up, I was concerned. I read the same letter about the fire apparatus. I actually went over to the fire station and talked to them, and they indicated that they have no problem making that turn with the existing engine. And I questioned about the truck, which was actually has a longer base, and indicated that that vehicle also has no problem making that turn. So as long as we don't, you know, as long as it's the same or close to that, they said they absolutely have no problem making that, that turn. So that was just. Yeah, I think that the, the turn, the radius of this turn hasn't changed at all. I, say, I, I can only look at the the poles that are out of the plastic poles that are in the street and assume that we There's were going to try. There's a slight change just in the curvature along Stockton Avenue. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, I was going to ask about the median, Steve. I mean, is is that distance on that crosswalk? I mean, is it really long enough to warrant a median? I mean, it's not like. Capitol Road. I mean, that that was a huge distance, and uh, I think it made a lot of sense up there. But this seems to be, you know, much narrower. Does it encourage more pedestrians kind of being stuck in the middle when otherwise they would just go all the way across? I think it 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 does two things. A, it provides some protection if if the car's not looking and and continuing. And the problem we have now is. You know, the car, there's no stop controls or any other controls in this intersection. So cars are rolling through. They're not looking for pedestrians. Mm -hmm. If you're 
on the one corner and there's a car on the other the lane farthest from you and they don't see you, you're kind of sticking your head out there and it just, just shortens the crossing. Um, I don't see sure. people really getting stuck in the middle. Um, I think, you know, they're, they're still going to be visible. It's not, you're not hiding them or anything. It's just giving okay. them protection. And it also, by narrowing the road, I think it, it, it forces cars to slow down. Um, you know, they're, that's one of the <coughs> prime traffic calming measures. The benefit, right. You narrow roads, mm -hmm. people have to drive slower because you can't drive, you know, comfortably through a, a narrow slot. So I think it provides those two benefits. Um, certainly, you know, this isn't wise Capitol Road. I, I no denying that, but I, I think the benefits of it and the m amount of traffic we get here, certainly the inter intersections, uh, you can see up at Stockton and Capitol Avenue, we did bulb outs to shorten the intersection. Um, and, and that has worked very effectively. I think that's the whole key is to, mm -hmm. to shorten the crossing. Fortunately, I don't think a bulb out um, on this section would be as viable in this location um, to do two bulb outs here. It, it works here. I mean, this, we're using a bulb out here to shorten this. Right. Um, okay. But I, I, you know, I'd be happy to look at it, but I think the median is uh, a good solution here. Yeah. Go ahead, Mike. Steve, you are going to remove the ADA ramp that goes from Peters, the, the um, yeah, the, the, there will be, there's a ramp where this old crosswalk is. There's yeah, a ramp I'm here. About that That'll old, get removed. This will get removed. A little further up there. Where this you see one will get removed. That will get removed. Okay. And good, this good. one will not be built. Got it. We left these in now. Um, we're, we're still going through the concepts here in case there was interest in, in maintaining this crosswalk. We kind of, here's the way we could do it, but um, those would not be built. On the delay, would we uh, lose Peter Dwyer's, um, you know, uh, involvement? Or are they eager to uh, proceed with this in any event? And so, my contacts with them—they were, they wanted to move. Um, would we lose them? I don't think so. They didn't suggest as much, but um, you know, the property manager just said, "Yep, I looked at it. Looks like it needs to be done. Let's get it done." Do we have I a plan line done for that area, Steve? Yeah, Bowman and Williams is, is working right now on, on finalizing all that okay. that sidewalk design. So um, I had to hope by middle of next week we have plans to him so that he can be looking at it. And are, we, are we being told that we have to have a coastal permit for changing your sidewalks? Um, that That is effectively the Coastal Commission's position on this, and uh, we have enough sticks, brands in the fire, if you will, with them that, um, you know, putting what, our head, my head together. Why don't we change it? We, we, we're allowed to do um, a number of things within within the coastal program that doesn't require going to them, including remodels under a certain size. In this case, we're not changing uh, the width of the sidewalk or the size of the sidewalk. We're adding ADA ramps, and we're, and we're just replacing the sidewalk. I'll tell you though the 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 spot where I think if because we debated whether or not we just push back on this, but um, recall that we're talking about widening the sidewalk on Stockton there, 18 inches, and one parking space is going away. So I think under an incredibly strict definition and read, I think that that um, we might lose on that point. Regarding the letting <laughs> regarding letter Peter, letting Peter Dwars go forward, don't we have we have an ADA liability there because he'll be taking away a ramp that that leads to an existing crosswalk that will remain in place. I think it would be ill advised to let that happen without the whole thing happening. Yeah, that's a good point. You follow me, Steve? The yeah, we would probably need to build that ramp. Um, and then we need to take it out. And we would take it out later. But it, take it out. It can yeah. get, yeah. You know, we don't want to mess with ADA. Thank you for catching let's, that let, nuance. Let's just, tell, let's just tell Peter we can't do it until we do the whole project. And he just has to live with that. I mean, that's what it is. Do keep in mind that under one model, it could be two contractors. You know, one, okay. their contractor, our contractor. So it isn't necessarily, you know, they may not necessarily button up perfectly. But, but regardless. he's asking for 50% split with the city. Yes. Can we get... Peter's money f now and then build it at the end of the summer. <laughs> Good luck with that one. Yeah, I know. That's what, what if we just gave you the flexibility in terms of the timing of, of, and in working with the, uh, you know, the, the property owners and, uh, and um, uh, you know, the schedule, the summer months, and as long as, you know, if we said we'd like to see it done by fall, 
uh, sometime, but you yeah, guys I think, and handle like I said, I, the intersection improvements, you know, I agree it's not ideal to do them in the center of the sidewalk, I and mean, it's just the effect on the businesses in the village to tear out the sidewalk in the summer is, 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 is not possible. So mm -hmm. that's why I think uh, Mr. DeWares and their representative are saying, you know, they would want to get it done. Right, sooner away. then, right, yeah. yeah. Or, or, or wait. And when, the other prop, prop, um, property owners that I've talked to, I said it, no, nothing would happen until fall. So um, as far as other sidewalk improvements. So I think, um, you know, the flexibility is great. We can try and do I, I, I sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's what I would, instead of just saying definitively, let's just put it off and not do anything until um, the fall without having, you know, maybe all the information at hand, give the staff the flexibility to work with all the parties, um, recognizing, you know, the complications and, and trying to put it together. And I think our interest, though, is, yeah, make it as soon as, as possible within the the reason of you know the the activity that takes place there and the interest of the private parties, um, so that's what I, I would suggest. I'd be respect. very much in favor of leaving it to staff's discretion as far as timing, right. what money we can get, what money we can't. Staff is painfully aware of the pressures on our village during the summer, right? And I don't think Public Works wants to manage a project in the middle of the height of the season, any more than we do. It is the busiest inter tr pedestrian. Tr Intersection in the whole city, it's yeah. right there. So um, we would be okay if you put it off till fall, though. Okay. Um, just we have lighting, though. We need uh, lighting. Yeah. I speaking of nice, uh, speaking yeah. of lighting, I understand. Yeah, some of the lights on the bridges are out, and so um, I think that that would be um, uh, something that maybe we could do right away to Absolutely. increase visibility there. Out there next week on that. Um, and since we have some potential savings from this crosswalk or this project, I was I wanted to maybe just spark some interest uh, about the crosswalk further up East Cliff coming across those parking places. I mean, it's kind of just um, a painted crosswalk at this time. Are you talking up Cliff Drive? I, I'm Cliff Drive, East Cliff Drive. Okay. Yeah, Cliff Drive. Um, so I, I, I mean, I would ask his staff to maybe look at that and seeing if we can maybe incorporate some safety features, some better visibility, maybe even some uh, lit crosswalks up there because at night, you know, there's no other lighting. It's pretty dark, uh, and people are crossing there. Um, Sketchy during the day, too, uh, with yeah. beachgoers. Yeah. yeah, people, yeah, and there's a lot of people that are going from those parking lots and residents that are walking across. That, that is a, it, it's one of the unfunded projects in our capital improvement program, right. but right. we could certainly well, kind of see if there's some uh, less expensive steps. I think yeah. the, the recommendation of the... Uh, traffic, ed, what was that? There's the Neighborhood Traffic Advisory Committee in its day was to uh, try and build some bulb outs there to make that crossing shorter, but maybe there's other elements and better signage right. we can put right. in there. So I'd Th be happy to look at that. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Um, so with that, if there are no other questions, yes, Mike? Yeah. No, I thought you were going to open up the... Okay. okay yeah, I'll, I'll wait till after. Okay. I'll, I'll just uh, ask, is there any member of the public that would like to address the council on this uh, item? Seeing none, I'm going to bring it back uh, for council uh, action. I'll move, I'll move for approval as recommended by staff, giving them a leeway on the timeline and bringing other property owners into the fray. And that we, um, um, if, if the project's put off until fall, that we, um, before summertime, that we add lighting along that crossway on both sides of the street to uh, whatever is feasible there. I will second both that. both sides of the bridge, too? Yeah. Okay. I will second that, and I have a question of the chief. And would you leave that map up there? I'd like to satisfy my curiosity and questions I've been asked countless times. Many people receive tickets for um, driving through a crosswalk while pedestrians are present. If a pedestrian is on the other side of a pedestrian safety island, can the traffic um, legally move across the crosswalk on the other side of the pedestrian island? <laughs> Not a, this is not a pop quiz, but <laughs> the way I understand and my recollection of the traffic laws is the vehicle actually has the right of way until they yield that to the pedestrian. In other words, until they stop. It's not as though you can just step off a, cro a sidewalk into the crosswalk as traffic is moving. And that's always been a bone of contention with pedestrians and that you have a free chance just to walk across because you're in a crosswalk. 
You actually have to wait until the vehicle yields to you because the roads are actually designed for vehicle really? traffic. Really? Yes. Thank you for I that. Thought it was that. Just, I thought it was just the opposite that that cars needed to yield to the pedestrians. Once the vehicle yields to the pedestrian who enters it, then they have the right of way. So they can't stop to wait until they get a good shot, in other words. <laughs> okay, got it. Okay. It, it is wow. very confusing, but yeah, it's and it happens a lot where we, people will get rear-ended because somebody stops and f to avoid hitting a pedestrian who just leaves the crosswalk before it, the vehicle yields to them. Rudy, I'd hate to I'd hate to go back to to car people driving cars and tell them they have a right of way in a crosswalk. Now, and unless the uh, you know, unless the law that has changed, record. Over the, yeah. <laughs> Johnny, <laughs> please don't put that in the paper tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> unless the law has changed over the couple of years, that's always been my recollection. Mm -hmm. Is that? Can we get a sign made that says that? <laughs> we need we need Ramona to weigh in on that because yeah. she's our uh, our street smart person. I do. Uh, Offer another answer Thank to, you, the, to the question is my understanding is this is considered one crossing from one side of the street all the way through the other street. So w once they've yielded, um, even if they're on the other side of the pedestrian safety zone, they must continue to yield until technically they're all the way across oh. the street. Okay. So Good. the answer, the, answer the, the island does not, uh, you know, provide the vehicle right to, to you mean through. I can't hit cars with my cane? Yeah. <laughs> no. Mm -hmm. I've bumped them with a wheelchair once or twice. So uh, with that, I'm going to call the... Just, just one I comment. We'll make it quickly. <laughs> I have a clarification I'd like to make. Oh. <laughs> I, I just want to reiterate that it, it's to support everybody else that I think it's better that we delay this project and do it right. It seems like there's too many complications that are involved with, with the sidewalks and access. And I'm glad that we're supporting the cooperative program. I think that sends a good message to all the other business owners, and I think we possibly might even, Dennis, you mentioned, you know, I'll personally I'm going to go talk to David Ling and see if we can incorporate right. that portion also. And to do it all in the fall would be, you know, we have so many so much going on, but I think it would be, be this is a great project, and if it's done and coordinated and we go through the Coast Commission, I think it's a great idea, so I do support this program. Right. Thank you, Ed. So I think it. Councilman Bottorf actually answered in, in here, but I just want to make sure we, our council direction is to establish a, a cooperative fund and we'll figure out funding later, but for right now, we'll, we'll create that fund and seek cooperative uh, replacement projects in the village. And, and th Ed, thank Ed for bringing up the idea of um, extending that sidewalk to be even with the rest of it by, from wine time on. Oh, uh, that's, that's it's going to make a world of difference. Yeah, I, th I think, I mean, the wider sidewalk in front of the restaurants now is, is so noticeable, and, and yes. I think we'll have the same feel there, too. Okay, one thing we have to consider, if anybody's been down there, is the color of the sidewalks we're doing before we do this next phase, because we do have a problem in front of the restaurants already. The new color is blue, so we won't blue. have a problem. No, yeah, dark brown would probably be <laughs> more... And, and, and along those lines, we for, we'll be talking to the businesses and it's trying to get It's more of an art than a science, that concrete coloring thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. With that, I'm going to call the question. All in favor of the motion? Aye. Aye. The motion passes unanimously. Uh, well, which brings us to you, the, the BRIC program. Uh, this is uh, to consider implementing a village personalized BRIC program. Yay. Uh, Lisa. Yes. Uh, thank you, Council. What I have before you is a request to bring back the personalized brick program, which, as you can recall, we did that back uh, in 2002. And we sold 1,700 bricks and made $60,000 for the city for the sidewalk program. And over the years, we've had a lot of requests for it to bring this program back. And since we are doing the new sidewalks there down on the Esplanade, so this is perfectly timely to ask if we can bring back this program. Uh, what we, it, it was, it's a big program. It's a big deal to try to implement and to um, administer. And so what we are recommending as staff is to um, authorize the Capitol of SoCal Chamber of Commerce to administer this program on behalf of the city. And in exchange, they will collect 50% uh, of the proceeds of the, of the program. We are working to identify um, somebody who will do the engraving of the bricks. It's not easy. The company that did it before is no longer available. Uh, and the question is, is going to be whether we are able to 
um, do the bricks in place or whether we'll have new bricks, um, they will be engraved off-site and then once we have a band sold, then we'll have them um, placed in, in the particular location. So I don't have a price yet for you. I don't have a lot of specific details because we're working with a couple of vendors to get the price under control because uh, it, it can be quite costly. So the recommendation is to go ahead and, and move forward with this program and we'll flesh out the details and share the, the proceeds with the Chamber of Commerce and the, the proceeds from the city would go into a sidewalk replacement fund. That's it. Are there any questions? Yes, Dennis. Um, just to give you a little institutional history in this thing that I was involved with the first one and why we did this to this day I don't know but what we did is the, the Chamber actually did all the work, oh, yeah. raised the money and gave all the money to the city. No, we split it. No. No, we split it no. last time, I think. No, uh-uh. Huh? Really? All of it went to the city. All of, every oh, all, penny all went, went to, the, to city. the city. How did Tony let us get away with that? I know. Times have changed. So, so in thought, in thought <laughs> that um, all of the 60000 went to the city last time with this thing. Once you, if you do this program and the chamber is really becomes, it, it, it's, a, it's a logistical nightmare because you have to lay out people's individual bricks where they are you know, meaning that some people like to be in front of the ice cream store, some people want to be over in front of, a, of a Paradise Beach Grill. And so that part there is a list of not taking any more staff time on this thing, not taking any more public money on this thing. Uh, all the work has to be done through the budget of this. I would not be afraid of giving all the money to the chamber. They, they didn't take any out the last time. They, they're going to administer this, and the, and the chamber puts money back into our community, back in, in the form of support of local businesses. So... I'm not afraid to give them all the, all the money that's made from this. I'm not afraid of that either. And my big question is, I know what the intent was last time, but this fabled um, village sidewalk fund that never really existed and never really saw any money, even though we took it all in, it sort of disintegrated into the general fund and even, there were even suggestions to have it be used for cleaning sidewalks, and that never happened. So, you know, rather than see it just dump into the general fund, I'd have no problem with giving it to the chamber and have some good done with it. I'd, I'd support you in that. Okay. Um, just to get a clarification about the proposal, it's to give the profits, 100 percent of the profits, to the right. chamber. Right. Mm. Right. Not, and then, well, they would cover the cost of the, the uh, of the engraving. The Any expenses to go against the project. Right. Any of the profits. Well, we'd hope to recoup that. The, the cost of the brick, you know, when people purchase it, it's going to be not only the cost right. to, to do the program, to implement it, uh, but it would be the profit as well. And for clarity's sake, I think our, I think our thinking was that it would go into this the sidewalk matching fund that we just set up here. But the, the previous item, it wasn't some elusive sidewalk fund. It was that they would, these would be become matching. I was dollars talking about the first time we did it. Right, right, it right. Went into the magical fund. It went into a magical fund. Right, it so. wasn't available. Yeah. This time we were thinking of a much more concrete use for it. Okay. Pun intended. Uh, oh. Uh. <laughs> um, is there any member of the public that would like to address the council on this? You happy with the idea of coming? Uh, she stayed here till 9.30. Tony has to I come know. and talk to us. Tony Castro, Capitola SoCal Chamber. Um, when we first did this project 12 or 13 years ago, Peter Hubbock was the chairperson for the chamber and insisted that we give all of the funding back to the city at that time. Um, and it was a very labor-intensive project. And um, that money was intended not to go back into the general fund, but into a special fund to help fund phase two or three. And this was, you know, 13 years ago. So I don't know what happened to that money, but it, it did go into the general fund, I believe. But um, we're still getting calls, as Lisa said, at the chamber office, too all the time, people want to engrave bricks. So it is a really good fundraiser. And I appreciate, you know, you're recommending that the chamber get 100%. But, um, why I'm saying this, but I think the city should get a cut in it too, because it, it needs to help pay for the project. No, 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 so. no. don't be silly. No, don't it, be silly. it does. Thank you. <laughs> how about, how about you just clean the sidewalks 
after the Art and Wine Festival. <laughs> okay. Deal. Okay, here we go. But, you but, can't but use Tony, Tony, just to be clear, when you say pay for the project, you mean pay well, the, the project is self-supporting. Yeah. When you sell the brick, right? You know that pays for the engraving of the brick, uh -huh. and then you know we put it in the sidewalk. And there's some cost to install it. There's some costs in doing incurred. that. Yeah, right. but it's it's a self-supporting project. There's money made to be made on that project, right. but you're paying for the expenses along the way. So there's no funding coming out of the city's pocket, mm -hmm. you know, to do this project. Correct. But the intent last time was for it to go into the next phase. And it just went into the general fund and, I don't know, disappeared. So. Well, in order to avoid that happening, you should keep the we'll profits from it. We'll set up a separate, it. we and could, you set could set up, up a separate a, fund. You could set up a separate fund. Sure. You could keep this project ongoing perpetually. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we could, so use, we could use engraved bricks for the skateboard park, mm -hmm. the dog park. Yes. You know, all of that. <laughs> yes. You put bricks all over the city. There's bricks everywhere. Yeah. Allows yeah. You to help pay for those projects. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for your general off offer, but I have a sense it may be rejected. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you. Okay. So, anything, uh, anyone else that would like to address the council on this item? So, I'm going to bring it back uh, for uh, council uh, action. Yep. I have some comments. I, I I am a big fan of the Chamber of Commerce, and Tony, I want to thank you for coming up and and your comments because I see this as a partnership. I have no problem. With with you taking you know, when the expenses come off, I would like to see the the like the proposal was made to share the profit and the stipulation I have on that is that you know you definitely need to be compensated and you do have alternatives for the money but it, I would like to see that our share as the city manager indicated goes into a dedicated uh, cleaning fund because that's where I think the big problem is with the with the village is we've got all this massive new sidewalk going in and we have no plans to increase the cleaning. We do the three or four a year and that's not sufficient. And part of the, the complaint that came out of the general plan was, you know, improve the sidewalks and then we have to take and maintain them. So um, I, I want to thank you, Tony, for really being sincere on that. I know that the fact that the individual, I, I, Peter Hubbock turned all the money over, that probably was a little overzealous. I think that you should have been compensated and, and I think that the recommendation here is that you run the program, you take pay for the expenses, you keep half, the city keeps half, and that half goes into uh, the cleaning fund because I don't necessarily want to put it into the sidewalk fund, but we are doing a lot of money. We're, we've got extensive deals that we've already done and we're going to do with the se severe cost for sidewalk replacement. So I, I think there's a reasonable point here, and I think, Tony, you hit it. You said exactly what it is. I, I think uh, pay the expenses, split it in half, and put the money in the dedicated cleaning fund. That's what I would feel fiscally responsible doing. Thank you, Ed. Any other comments? Is there a motion? I'll move that uh, that we, um, um, we we approve staff's recommendation with this, with 100% of the proceeds going to the Chamber of Commerce for this time only, making up for the previous year's commitments. I'll second that. Um, just for clarification, if it's 100% of the proceeds, and but out of the proceeds, the expense of implementing the project the profits. would be so. I'm saying the profit. Profit. Also. Okay, 100% 100% of the profits uh, from the program uh, would go to the chamber. And it, it takes no more labor time from the city to implement this. Okay. Um, any further discussion on that motion? Um, just speaking to uh, Ed made an excellent point about. Um, I think our need and responsibility to keep the sidewalks clean. Um, I, I think that that is the city's responsibility in, in working in tandem with the uh, private uh, owners, uh, the businesses in front of those sidewalks. Um, I don't think we should be dependent upon this fundraising effort uh, to uh, carry out or to dictate our level of diligence on that effort. So to me, that should be a separate, independent, diligent effort to keep our city clean um, and not have it be tied uh, to uh, this particular fundraising project. And so I, I, I support your um, uh, concept, Ed. Uh, I just think we need to be looking at a different way to uh, carrying out that responsibility. So with that, all in favor of the motion? Aye. And all opposed? No. Uh, so we have, uh, and uh, I'll vote aye, so the motion passes three to one 
and note that uh, Councilman Bortoff voted no. And thank you. And so which will bring us to the last item this evening, uh, which is to consider a contract with Community Television of Santa Cruz County to provide programming for the city's public education and government channels uh, and authorize the city manager to execute the contract. Um, and is there a staff report? Yes, I'll keep it brief. Uh, Community Television has been operating our PEG channels and broadcasting our council meeting and our planning commission and our special meetings live since 2005. Um, with the, the cable franchising changing with the with DIVCA, the state ordinance, and new federal law, uh, typically the way these, the contract's funded is through the um, PEG fee we charge all of our cable su subscribers, which is 64 cents per subscriber. And the, all of that fund, all those funds, according to our old contract, would then just move right over to pay for all the operational and personnel and capital equipment costs um, that needed to, to fund the channels. Well, again, because of the change in the law, you can no longer do that, and so therefore we need to, to revamp our contract, and in addition, our contract was expired. And so uh, because PEG funding, can, you cannot use it for the operational costs, uh, you can only use it for capital equipment purchases. We need to have a new contract based that way, and the funding needs to now come from our general fund and not necessarily not from the PEG fund. And so the contract now is on an hourly basis. It's $50 an hour, which is a reasonable rate. We went out, I, I took a look around, uh, particularly in the fact, in light of what we get for that, and we get technical services as well. We have very capable staff from, from the community television uh, who know our system, have been operating our system, and, and have been trained. In addition, we, we'll have some, um, provide training workshops to our residents on, on creating their own television shows and their own uh, use the studios for com at community television. And they'll create two public service announcements covering any community event we may want as well, which is exciting. We didn't have that before. Uh, and uh, last but not least, the if we, uh, we get 10 hours of technical support at no charge, and after that, it's a $30 per hour charge. And staff is recommending that you uh, execute this contract. That's it. Thank you. Are there questions? Okay. Um, I just wanted to note in the packet there's a letter from Charter, um, you know, uh, I guess pointing out to us uh, that the federal law uh, only allows the PEG funds to be used for uh, capital improvements and not for general operating. Um, and, and since the general operating funds are what community television uh, principally relies upon to be able to carry out its function, uh, my view is that really ha hampers uh, their abilities. Um, and it also requires that the city, uh, in order to provide, um, you know, community access uh, to our meetings, that we will now have to pay out of our general fund uh, for this. We're collecting, um, uh, what, from 17000 to 19000 per year in PEG funds. Um, what if if we're only um, and and this contract is for about eight or ten thousand and we can't pass on the peg funds to the community television any longer? What becomes of the difference? We'll utilize that for capital equipment purchases. So utilizing you know new microphones or new television cameras, new lighting. We can use it for any any capital equipment purchases that will help uh, enable and improve access to those channels, but just not on the operational personnel cost. So right now we So for the city's yeah. uh, capital improvements mm -hmm. uh, expenses. Capital cool. improvements associated with broadcasting council meetings. Uh, yes, Mike. Could we not pass on these funds to community television for improvement in their infrastructure in providing us with public access? Improvements in their infrastructure if we wanted to give them the funding, if we had contract with them? I think if we want to utilize those funds... No, I want to still pay them the contract to do the services, but I want to take the PEG funds, and if they're capital improvements, I'm sure community television could use capital improvements to help facilitate the public access to our meetings. You know, I think I'd have to ask the city attorney that, because I think it has to be specifically related to this city at Capitol. The funds need to stay here, and to aggregate the funds, you know, to pull them over there with the with the general population, I guess, because community te television services quite a few different agencies. I, I'm not sure what the legality of that. Well, if, all, if we get together with the other cities and all of us 
you know, contribute some of our PEG funds. I think that community television would benefit, the cities would benefit, and Charter and Comcast can benefit. Yeah, I, I was certainly looking to see what other funds or how we can use our funds capital equipment-wise to assist with our yeah, access. I, yeah, I think it would certainly be uh, worthwhile to explore that, uh, have the city attorney uh, look at those uh, possibilities and to see what we can do. I would also like to explore what percentage are we charging charter uh, f for these PEG funds? What percentage? Well, it's 64 cents per subscriber. It's a pass-through, so we don't charge charter necessarily for it. It's, it's a part of the rate that's charged to the customer. In addition but, but to charger, the franchise charger fee. Charger collects it from the customer and passes it on uh, to us. Mm -hmm. and I was just wondering, what percentage is that of the typical, you know, charger bill? And, and it, does Charter have the ability to uh, pass this on to the subscriber? To pass on the... The peg. Are you suggesting that we change the peg rate? Well, that's what I'm ultimately getting to. We yes. actually have it in our ordinance. It's set at 64 cents per subscriber, and the DIVCA law forced us to set that amount. We couldn't raise it. We're, we're, we're limited in what we can do in raising it. You certainly can drop it, but you can't I thought the it. maximum was 5%. That's our franchise fee. It's, different. it's not, too different. It, and the PEG fee doesn't um, also correlate to that, no, our, our, our percentage? Two, no, there's two separate. So the 5% for the franchise fee of the, of the total revenue collected, uh, less the, the, the PEG fee. And the PEG fee is a separate charge, which we set in our municipal code because of the, the DIVCA law that came through, which only it set a maximum amount of what we could set it at, what was our existing rate. So that was all that we could set it at. Okay. So we're currently at the maximum that we Allowable can... Allowable by the state law. ...that mm -hmm. we can charge. Um, Okay, well, I think uh, we should certainly look at um, uh, the possibility and feasibility of whether or not um, uh, these PEC fees uh, can be, um, you know, passed on to uh, community television for their infrastructure. I didn't read that in the letter from Charter um, uh, concerning their prohibitions. Um, and. Um, so I think that that would be worthwhile to also look at. I'm going to ask if there's any member of the public that would like to address the council on this item. Good evening, Mayor, Council, staff. Uh, I'm Nick Brandt, Technology Director for Community Television in Santa Cruz County, and I appreciate the opportunity to come and speak to you about this contract. Um, we're excited to continue our, our work with you uh, to provide the meetings and to operate the meetings. Um, and I appreciate the discussion that's gone on here this evening. Um, you may have heard about us in the news a little bit. Um, we're redesigning ourselves right now, literally going through a, a renaissance, if you, so to speak, because of the DIVCA ordinance, uh, which only allows us to spend money on capital and not on, uh, and not on operating, which is the, the reason for these contracts. And so we've had to redesign a new management plan, new business model, and new technology infrastructure in order to, to keep our doors open. Um, this contract is a direct correlation of that, and that is we've been able to um, simplify our contracts, uh, tell you exactly how much it costs for us to operate the meeting, and then, and then, and then write that into an hourly rate for you so that so that you can can pay for exactly what you're you're getting and a little bit more, as she said, there there are some some increased services there in this contract that weren't there before that we're excited to offer. So um, I just wanted to offer my uh, support and thanks for for uh, you considering this contract and then to answer any questions for you. And just just so you know, um, as a part of our rebirth, we are relaunching the entire station uh, here on April 15th from. 5 to 7 p.m., and you're all invited. Um, we've redesigned our, our entire technological infrastructure. We're now in eight, uh, a high-definition studio, and we'd love to have you all come out and uh, check it out uh, 5 to 7, April 15th. And I can answer any questions you might have or, 
or any questions. Uh, uh, Councilmember Tremini, I really appreciate the the offer of of, of, of forwarding those 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 funds to to us uh, for our capital improvements because that's kind of how public access works. Um, you know, uh, all the jurisdictions get together, you know, provide these workshops through through as as much relevant technology as we can provide. So so I really appreciate that. Nick, how much has uh, DIVCA uh, impacted your budget over the past few years? So um, it, it's mostly impacting us right now because we had a uh, $770,000 budget and it's been cut to $340,000 in this past year. Yeah. Okay, so we've had to do uh, all of our, all of our uh, personnel restructuring and uh, basically what we have now is a system where uh, we have a lot of really great technology and no one to operate it. And so, and so that's that's really what you're what you're looking at here, and that's why we're uh, streamlining our contracts so that so that our personnel costs are exactly what it takes to operate that equipment. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Nick, for yeah, coming absolutely. and speaking to us this evening. Um, uh, is there anyone else that would like to address the council on this item? Seeing none, I'm going to close the microphone. Um, just uh, on the staff report, uh, Lisa. In the first paragraph, it, where it refers to the amount collected, it says, uh, which amounts to 17000 to 19000 per year. The last sentence then reads, this entire amount would then be passed on to CTV. That's the old contract. That was under the old contract. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and so we are, in effect, reducing our uh, support for community television almost 50%. Um, so, uh, and I just wanted to express to everyone, you know, since um, DIPCA has come into play, which has really been promoted by the cable companies, um, there have been over a hundred community television stations th throughout the nation that have shut down. Um, and our community television, as you've just heard from Nick and how their budget has been slashed, is in jeopardy of having that same thing happen. Um, and this, I mean, to me, this letter from Charter Communication uh, is just, uh, you know, another example of, of how they are trying to force out uh, community television uh, and really what is community access uh, to, um, um, to us. And so, um, you know, I hope everybody would speak to their legislatures about these impacts. I think that we should try to resist them as much as we possibly can uh, to make sure that we don't have the same result here of our community television closing down. Um, so um, uh, I, I just wanted to make that point before we move on with um, our action. Yes, uh, Dennis. I would bet, and I know there's no way to judge this right now, that we probably have one-tenth of the audience watching this program now that we had 10 years ago. And the reason is, is that the number of, of charter contracts that are out there are so limited. So if you're doing anything that's cable, or I mean, excuse me, satellite bound, we're not getting this, this thing. Where it seems to me the value to us today is in, in, in uh, history, recording history. In other words, the, the recording and the archives of our meetings, which you can go online to get. Um, now, correct me if I'm wrong, I, I think, why can't you go on a computer right now and watch this program? So if you, if you didn't have that technology, probably our, 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 our watching audience is pretty limited to what it was then because at that time Charter was the only service we had in town and everybody watched it. You always talk to people in town that watch the programs. I very seldom talk to people now that, that watch the council meetings. I think it has a lot to do with that. Well, partially, but also the fact that this program is rebroadcast by community television mm -hmm. on Comcast stations is very, very relevant to this on discussion. Comcast? On Comcast? Mm -hmm. and it's important to us, and you know, uh, I can't begin to tell you. I, I work with a lot of, um, in part of my day-to-day -day life, a lot of broadcast professionals, and we've had the the pleasure in the last year of working with Nick, and I would put him up against anyone in the network that I've worked with, and the fact that we have him in community television, you know, the technical expertise and the cooperation of our community television, is beyond anything that I've experienced anywhere else in any other city. So I would move the staff recommendation. I'll second that. 
Uh, and but to add, I would like uh, the staff to uh, evaluate uh, whether or not we can and somehow, I mean, get back up to the levels of funding that we have had in the past, and whether oh. that's to build in um, infrastructure support uh, for community television. The and that is that part of doing. my motion, you know. Yeah. Looking into that. And my second. Okay, great. Um, any other comments? Um, Seeing none, um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Nick, for coming and speaking to us this evening. Um, so with that, we're going to uh, bring us to the end of the meeting. I'll ask if there's any final uh, announcements uh, this evening. I have, a, I have a final comment I'd like to make. Yes, go ahead, Ed. <clears throat> just want to make an announcement that uh, tomorrow the Santa Cruz Sentinel is going to be publishing a story uh, I'm not going to go into the details of that story, but the nature of the story is that uh, I was arrested in January of last year. There was a lengthy investigation that went on, and ultimately the charges were dismissed. I want to make it clear that at no time did I use this job or any of my influence to uh, my, my job here to have any impact on that decision, and that's all. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, and hearing that, I'd like to ask the city attorney if they will, if he will do an investigation and provide a written report to the council on uh, uh, whether we have any legal uh, responsibilities uh, in response to um, uh, what we've just heard. Okay, right. I'll be happy to do that. Thank you. Um, with there being nothing else, I will adjourn this meeting to the next regular meeting of the council to be held on Thursday, April 24th, 2014 at 7 p.m. in the City Hall Chambers. Uh, good night. Thank you, everyone, for your participation and good work.